بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد. So uh, first I'd like to thank uh, the staff here at MCC for allowing us to use their beautiful room and facility to, uh, to do this one day seminar inshallah and also Sheikh Barat Rabbani and Seekers Hub for uh, arranging this weekend program here in uh, Joba in SBIA and here today in MCC and tomorrow in SR. You guys love acronyms. San Ramon. San Ramon, Slavic sense. Um, tomorrow, incidentally, if you're interested, the program will be about social justice uh, and Islam. It will touch on a couple, a number of themes that we might go over today, but uh, in general, it's going to be something distinct and separate from, from what's going on today for those of you who have uh, inclination to spend uh, and bore yourself the whole weekend listening to me. So if you're that brave, then uh, that's available, inshallah. So uh, as I mentioned last night in the introduction, um, I had uh, said that we developed this kind of wasn't really a seminar, something that I thought over uh, a couple, a number of years, uh, and I've kind of condensed it. I don't think we, it's about 90 slides as it stands right now, I'm not sure we'll get through all of them. But the idea behind it was to give people an uh, understanding of the um, sort of universal, um, singular underpinning of Islam, in the sense that People who have studied a little bit understand that there are different disciplines uh, in Islam in terms of how we go about studying it. So there are things that are associated with studying the, uh, the etiquettes of behavior, the etiquettes of worship, um, the foundations of belief, the um, spiritual programs for spiritual rectification. Uh, the methodology of interpreting the Qur'an and Sunnah, or Surah uh, al methodology of tafsir, so forth, of, of interpreting the Qur'an. All of these things uh, have a uh, unique and singular foundation that they go back to. What I mean by that is, if you were to walk into, say, a, a fifth class somewhere, or a hadith class, or a tafsir class, the way that these particular disciplines look at the world uh, are going to be unified. You are not going to feel like, oh, these muhadithin, they really see things much differently than the fuqaha or uh, al-usuliyin. There will be some differences in what they put emphasis upon, no question about that. But the way that they kind of understand the reality of the universe and the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and our personal reality is all one, it's all the same. Contrast this if you walk into uh, a class at any Western university, and I should say any Eastern university at this point, uh, whether it's in sociology or anthropology or ecology or economics or finance, and you'll be left with the impression that these disciplines don't really talk to each other. And the sociologist has a particular view of the world that seems to be at odds with the psychologist and the ecologist and the economist and so forth. So there is no universality in those disciplines. So university, the, the name originally was meant to mean that it is a universality that, that's inherent within it. But now we have very compartmentalized ways of looking at knowledge, uh, specifically talking about the Western tradition. And that was a particular historical trajectory uh, that happened, especially post-Enlightenment, where the foundational underpinnings of Western civilization were more or less uh, challenged, uh, rebuked, rebutted, and ultimately discarded uh, in favor of a new way of looking at the world where now the physicalism, if such a word exists, of how we understand the world. In other words, via data and instrumentation and mere physical aspects. What's commonly referred to as empiricism. 
And so anything that is knowledge then is going to be confined to what we can measure, what we can see, uh, what our instruments can perceive, whether it's the naked eye, whether it's a microscope, whether it's a telescope. And what you see is what you get uh, under the microscope. So if you can see atoms and electrons and atoms under your electron microscope, then that's a quantum reality. But beyond that, without the electron microscope and you see an apple, right, then according to some it's an apple. But according to those who have electron microscopes, no, it's actually a bunch of atoms that are just in our perception, it looks like an apple, but there's a lot of empty space there and it's kind of a quantum reality and so forth. So the, the, uh, the extent to which, why, by which empiricism has dominated the way that people perceive reality and then per perceive knowledge has also extended into not just the physical sciences, <clears throat> but also the social sciences. And so now, uh, when we want to talk about human behavior, for example, and why people do things at the, way, what the, the way that they do them, and how to uh, treat certain things the way that they do them, it's all become empiricized. So there has to be a particular study, right? How many of the studies that come out that uh, drinking three or four cups of coffee a day is good for you? And then we hear another study that three or four cups of coffee a day actually is not that good for you, right? And, you know, the, the science behind that actually, uh, and that tells you it's knowledge, it's actually a very limited way to look at it. There's a thing called a sample size, and depending upon the, the, how big the people that they, the number of people that they worried about this and to see the effects. And then there's an implicit assumption that uh, correlation equals causation. Right, because you can't. Really, it's very difficult to isolate a particular cause. You know, maybe the hundred people that did well with coffee had other things about them they did well with, like exercise, like genetics, like a whole myriad of things that it's so difficult to isolate. But these studies then give you the impression just because there's a correlation, in other words, B is associated with A or B comes after A, then it must mean causation. In other words, A caused B, and this is how the modern world works. And for Muslims, I think, uh, we said this the other day, I think yesterday in Jumaat, we are kind of the last, um, for lack of a better word, we're kind of the last stronghold for maintenance of the traditional way of looking at life. Other religions had it, other systems had it, um, but they have more or less dispensed with that in favor of reconciling whatever traditional system they have with modernity. Um, we're resistant to do that, right? We have a, there are people who are trying to do that, right? Who are trying to say, well, Islam is actually, is, is, is consistent with modernity, right? Not with being modern, those are two different things, but with modernity, in other words, the presuppositions that tell us what it is about the modern world, like just what I explained about the physicality and the, and the, and the over uh, reach of empiricism, sometimes referred to as scientism. Right, that the world can be explained and everything in it eventually only by means of scientific data. Right, Stephen Hawking is looking for the theory of everything, or what they call the meta narrative, that's going to explain how the whole world works, and it's going to be found in a singular equation. Right, there's going to be some type of equation we'll write on the board like that, maybe ten boards next to each other that will explain. Okay, this is how everything works. And so reducing, right, it's also called reductionism. It's kind of reducing our understanding of the world to that which can only be measured or seen or uh, perceived either via sense perception or instrumentation or whatever it may be. But the Quran clearly tells us that there are different awalim, right, there are different worlds or perhaps not different realities, but depending upon your vantage point, Right, you're going to have a different perception of what that reality is. So there's alim al ghayb wa alim al alim al mulk wa alim al malakut. Right, there's, there's the world that can be perceived, right, that we can witness it, and there's alim al ghayb, right, that which cannot normally be perceived, but it's still real. This is where, where, where the problem happens. It's still real. In fact, we might even say it's more real than this illusory world that we observe, because our senses, our perceptions, 
can deceive us. But Adam and Ghaib, right, is haq. Right? We're, we're, it's one of the see of the formulas in the tashahud is we say, and the al is haq, wa yawm al qiyamati haq. Right? They're real. Right? They're not just some type of myth. You know, modernity will tell you all these things are mythical. Right? The Muslims have this mythical narrative of um, Adam falling from paradise with Eve and coming to the earth, and they call that. You know, they, they don't believe that to be knowledge. They believe that to be some type of myth that somehow is com comforting to people who choose to believe in it. Um, and then the Western liberal tradition will allow you to kind of take that on faith and to have a, a sort of private um, uh, practice of your faith. But the minute that you introduce this into the public sphere and start saying, well, no, it's not just faith, it's, I can, it's knowledge, something that I know, it's not just something I believe in. This is where, you know, the, the system that's all around us will reject such a notion. You know, you're allowed to kind of do it in as much as there's a recognition of human rights and so forth, individual rights, you practice your faith, right? But once you bring it to the public sphere, then it's no longer acceptable. So many Muslims, I think, nowadays are struggling with, with a lot of these things, especially people in um, university and people who are contending with these different philosophical systems. You know, a lot of our uh, young people, our children and our brothers and sisters, they go into something like biochemistry or biology or even mathematics, and they think these are value-neutral ways of looking at the life. You know, like, well, you know, there's no philosophy in, in math, right? We're not talking about Hume or Kant or Rousseau or Voltaire or any of those people. They're not going to mess around with, with our heads. But there is nothing that's value neutral. Every discipline, every discipline of knowledge has a particular, particular presuppositions about it, about the way that it looks at the world, right? Even math, definitely biology, right? Definitely chemistry, definitely <coughs> physics. So they're not value neutral in that sense. So, uh, one of the things that, for example, sometimes we're, uh, we have an illusion about is somehow there is this, uh, there's this problem between science and religion. That, you know, it's either science or it's religion. It's either hard data and facts, or then there's the paradigm of faith and spirituality. And those are like two irreconcilable worlds. And the reason that we have this particular notion, or I would call it illusion, is because that was the historical trajectory in Europe and in the West in general, that there was this clash, uh, there was this lack of reconciliation between faith, spirituality, and empirical knowledge. Um, however, in the Muslim historical narrative, that wasn't really the case. The people who were faith practitioners and people of spirituality were also the scientists and the astronomers and the chemists and the biologists and those who studied anatomy. They didn't see this contradiction between the two. Um, and in fact, it was their faith that propelled them to kind of look at the, at the universe, look at creation, look at the world, and then see the wisdom behind all of the beauty in God's creation. This is what propelled them to do so. Um, whereas now, most scientists today are atheists, at least in the West. Um, and most of them see that there is a direct uh, confrontation between those people who espouse faith and religion and then those people who take a scientific view of the world or view of reality. Um, and then we get caught up in that and we think we have to choose as well, but we didn't really develop this particular way. The only issue that with science is there are certain things science tries to answer the question to because as I said before it's an overreach. The origin of the universe is a question science cannot answer, even though they try to answer it. Right, because we're talking about something that cannot be physically measured or perceived by empirical data. It's always going to be a conclusion drawn, or an inference drawn upon something that may be physical or may not be physical. But they can't recreate the creation of the world. They cannot uh, do it in a lab and then say, okay, well, we did all of these, bombarded these gases one with another, and life came out of it. Right? And even the Qur'an challenges people with such a notion. Surah Al-Hajj says, if you can create life, can you create even a fly? 
of the web. And you give life that way. And no one has been able to do that, right? Which is a sign that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give life. You know, cloning cells in a petri dish is not giving life. You took life and you life from life, but life from the raw material, from nothing whatsoever, can you make life? No. So, um, this we, we, we call it understanding the Islamic paradigm, kind of how do we look at life and how do we understand things, and not just Islam as a set of, of ritual devotional acts. Yes, indeed, Buddha and Islam wa ala khams. Islam has been uh, built upon five things, in other words, the pillars of Islam. But um, there is also a very strong, uh, what we call, metaphysical grounding of Islam. In other words, the way that we look at the world, the way we perceive the universe. You know, Allah exhorts us in the Qur'an to study the creation around us. And He calls all of the myriad things of creation, He calls it ayat. Right? The difference in the languages that you speak and in the ethnicities that you come from, there are signs. That's why some of the Arlan that refer to the two books that Allah has revealed. The book of Allah, namely the Quran, and then there's the book of creation, right? And Kaum, Kitabullah al Masdur wa Kitabullah al Mandur. The book within the lines, the Quran, and the books that is seen and perceived, that is to be studied, not so that can be manipulated, not so that it's at the mere uh, whim and want and physical disposal of the human being, but rather to be studied to see the signs in it. Right? And in fact, this is the way that we know God. Because we can't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His essence. It's incomprehensible to us. But we can know Him by His athar, by His ayat, by tajalliyat al asma al sifat right? The manifestations of the divine names enacting and executing the divine will in the kawn, in the creation. You know, of rizq, of imata, of ihya, right? Of giving sustenance to things, of bringing life to things, of taking life away from things. All of these are referred to as tajalliyat, as manifestations of Allah's will, as, uh, as understood via the divine names and attributes. So it's a much, much different way of looking at the world. And while many Muslims today in the world have a, uh, uh, you know, are devoted from a ritual aspect, that they pray and they fast, and many are not, unfortunately, many are not committed, but I would say that we have, for the most part, not really imbibed this idea that, you know, looking at the world in an Islamic way, or in a, in a way that Allah SWT has revealed for us to be looking at it. Um, you know, and there have been some attempts at reconciling these things, but I, in my estimation, um, these attempts lack the, the, uh, the, you know, the metaphysical underpinning that we have just been talking about. So, for example, people will talk about the uh, miracle of science in the Quran. Clearly this was meant as to be, you know, a way to show the, uh, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an by reconciling it with particular scientific uh, data or discoveries and, and so forth. And while that may work in some instances, uh, that's not why the Qur'an is miraculous, right? It's inimitable, it's marges, people can't imitate it, not necessarily because it talks about how the bulamet, falath, or, or the three periods within the womb correspond to the three periods uh, uh, in, in the stages of the fetus, from embryo to fetus, and then to a fully developed child. Yes, there may be some correspondence, but uh, it's kind of a, uh, I would say, a, a lazy attempt. Not to take away from those people who have contributed to this, but we have such a, a rich tradition of how the Qur'an is miraculous way beyond these kind of scientific things. And then what if one day uh, science says something different, right? And well, we already kind of committed to the previous position. What do we do then, right? And this is the problem, uh, or this is the scenario that, uh, for example, the Christian tradition ran into trouble with before, right? When they postulated things about, you know, the universe, you know, the Catholic Church really suffered trauma because 
it believed in uh, a geocentric universe. Their interpretation of the Bible or the Old Testament was it's geocentric. And maybe it wasn't even based upon something they read in the Old Testament or New Testament, but they said, well, man is the center of the universe, hence Earth is the center of the universe. That means all of the planets and the sun revolve around the Earth. And they made a, a theological commitment to that position. So in the early 15, 1600s in Europe, when people like Galileo and even before Galileo, Copernicus were questioning the idea of this geocentric universe because they tried to figure out, looking at the sky every night, and they see the position of the planets and the stars, and they said, it doesn't make sense. How could it be geocentric? Right? And Ptolemy, who was the Greek, who postulated the geocentric universe, they had to add so many um, contingencies and variants for the whole solar system to work. In other words, to predict where Mars and Venus were going to be on a given night, or where the moon would be, and, and so forth. Um, until we get to Copernicus, and probably even before Copernicus, some of the, the Muslim astronomers also postulated the same idea that maybe the whole thing is wrong. Maybe it's not the Earth is the center of the universe, maybe it's the Sun that is the center of the universe, and we go around the Sun. Right? And initially they thought it was spherical orbits. Spherical orbits didn't work either. Right? And then they said, well, maybe it's an elliptical orbit, but then why is it an elliptical orbit? How come it's not spherical? And why does what is what governs the movement? Hence the idea of gravity, right? And gravitational forces and so forth. So the, all of these developments were a, a direct challenge to positions that the church committed to. And so when the church commits to something like that, and then you say it's wrong, it's not just the church is wrong now. Maybe the whole thing is wrong. Maybe the whole idea of religious dogma is wrong to begin with. Right? And they got into trouble with other things. Some of them said that the universe is only 6,000 years old. And that was a position as well. Uh, for us, we don't have, in our tradition, the Prophet Islam did not speak of these matters as matters of essential creed or aqidah. I don't recall the hadith, I haven't come across anything where he said that the earth is the center or the sun is the center of the universe. So that's even um, something that we, uh, we should be concerned with. And even in the Qur'an, what, you know, because the Qur'an, there's sabab nizul, and there's reasons for certain verses are revealed, even though it's the pre-eternal speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the Sahaba asked, as the Qur'an mentions, يَسْأُلُنَكْ عَنِ الْأَهِلَّةِ They ask you about the hilal, the ahilla, you know, the crescent, moon. In other words, they observe the moon in the lunar month, and they notice that, you know, in the beginning of the month, what they consider to be the beginning of the month, uh, it's a, sl a small sliver, which is you know, the new moon, and then it gradually gets bigger, then it's a quarter moon, then it becomes full moon in the middle of the month, and then it goes gradually back to the sliver again, and then it dissipates. So they're wondering, how does that work? Because they're just seeing, they're not seeing that, well, it's the shade of the sun and the earth getting in between, and it's, the moon is still there, and it's not really getting smaller, right? But they were asking, how, how is that? How does it get smaller and get bigger and so forth? So how did the Qur'an respond, and how did the Prophet was, was, was requested by Allah to respond? Say, it is mawaqeet linnas wal hajj. It's a way for you to measure your mawaqeet, right? To measure time. Wal hajj, right? Because we operate on a lunar month, and so 12 lunar months, and each lunar month is 29 or 30 days, and hence this is a way for you to measure the different cycles and time, and you know where Ramadan is, and you know where Dhul Hijjah is, and you know where Riyal Awal is, and the rest of the lunar months, and so forth. So it didn't actually answer the question the Sahaba were seeking an answer to. In other words, the scientific uh, reasoning behind how this gets smaller and bigger. Rather, it redirected them to what you should be concerned about in terms of your uh, ibadah, in terms of your responsibilities, in terms of your taklif. Right? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually made requisite upon you, this is the thing that you should be concerned about. Um, so, while it doesn't deny that one can study and look at those things, they were never theological issues. They weren't issues for us to, to debate about from a theological sense, you know, are you still a Muslim if you think the earth is flat, or the earth is, uh, is spherical? 
And I disagree. There are Muslims who have campaigns about how the earth is flat still today. Does that take them out of Islam? No, but, you know, they, they're funny. That's it. But, um, <laughs> or even if they think that the, 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 the earth uh, is stationary and all of the planets circulate around it, is that an issue of aqidah? Right? No, not really. Uh, even if you can infer from the Qur'an certain verses and they're all in their orbits and so forth and maybe the earth also is included in that that is an interpretive inference, right? It's not something that's like a, a direct like this is the Aqib, this is the way it is but do I have to believe in the existence of the angels? Yes because I'm having a burden with that that's part of taklif do I believe in the existence of all of the prophets, even though we've never seen them? Indeed. Do I believe in Yom al even though it's yet to come? Yes. Do I believe in Jannah or not? Yes. Right. So these are things that the way that we know about them is that they came from the Sadiq and the Masbuk, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They came from the one who is the, the truthful one and the one who's always believed. And if we believe in the absolute honesty, and that's a cornerstone of our aqidah, the absolute honesty, trustworthiness of the Prophet Muhammad then everything that he came with is true. Everything that he came with is true. And so those things he did not speak about or he remained silent about, especially, you know, of what we could call science or origins and, you know, how, how is it that from two people, Adam and Hawa, we get seven billion people, you know, X number of years later and different languages and different ethnicities and living in all different parts of the world. I would say, okay, interesting PhD, go study that. But is it a matter of aqidah, right? Is it a matter of uh, a theological grounding that believe or not believe? No, it's not. So we can have different opinions about it. Even the origins of language, you know, some of the argument discussed, there's different madahib. The different ideas. Imam Suti talks about some of them in the Muslim. He says some people thought that language was the two major kind of schools of thought. It's either Tawqifi or Tawfiqi. Right? Uh, Tawqifi means what from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alama adam al asma'a kulla. He taught Adam all of the names. So they said all the names means all of the primordial languages. Right? So there's sort of an ancient Semitic primordial language that is very much like Arabic. And then all of the Semitic languages came from that, which include Hebrew and Aramaic, right? And then there's a primordial language that was a Germanic language, and another one that was, you know, uh, uh, Chinese or, or Asian language, and so forth. That's one opinion. And then the languages developed from that. Then there's Tawfiq, right? Madhabit Tawfiq means, no, language is a convention to begin with. It's a human convention. So the first human beings, you know, they have different opinions. Someone heard, you know, a rock fall and it went plunk, and then he called the rock. Let's call that a plunk because that's the sound it makes when it falls down. Right? Muhakat al aswad as they call it. Another opinion. So there's no like universal theological opinion about okay, what's the origin of language? We don't even have a, a, a consensus on who the Dabih was. Who is the one that Ibrahim السلام, was going to sacrifice? Was it Ismail or was it Ishaq? Yes, the majority of ulama and Jumhur say it's in Ismail. Right? But there are some very prominent ulama, amongst some Imam Malik, Rabbi Lauren, who said no, it's in Ishaq. Right? And then somehow Muslims get in this sort of, uh, what's the word, to see fit, you know, get all upset. Oh, wait a minute, no, it can't be Ishaq. Why was wrong with Ishaq? Somehow he's the Jewish prophet, and somehow Ismail is the Muslim prophet. But that's even an uh, incorrect interpretation, because they're both prophets of Islam. And they're both sons of Ibrahim. So whether it was Ismail or whether it was Ishaq, that's not the point of the story. Anyway. Right? But the point of the story is the sacrifice Ibrahim السلام, was willing to make with one of his sons. Um, and then there's a third school, you know, that says we don't know which one it was. What's called madhab al tawaqquf. Tawaqquf means I don't have enough information. It has not been revealed to us definitively whether it's Ismail or Ishaq. So in this case, I don't have to have an opinion. I can choose not to have an opinion. And what? In other words, until we get something that's concrete and something that is you know, unequivocal, then we don't have to have an opinion about it. 
And in the age that we live in now, to, for you to say, well, I don't have an opinion about the issue. Nobody does that anymore, right? Anything that can be happening on the complete opposite end of the world, right? You know, uh, there's some type of issue going on in Jakarta, Indonesia today. If you go and ask somebody about it, what do you think about this? And they'll have some opinion about it. Based upon what? Right? We don't have to interject our opinion into everything. And in fact, it was from the adab, the etiquette of Muslims, and it is an essential uh, etiquette based upon an essential hadith. One of the first hadith we learned that we teach our kids from the from the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi, that from the good Islam of a person is to leave that which is not concerned with. Right, and our parents as young children, they told us, like, mind your own business. Right, don't get involved in things that don't concern you. Why? Because if, if you truly were only involved in things that do concern you, you wouldn't have time for the things that don't concern you. You would be so busy with all of the things that, in fact, do concern us. Right, we have many responsibilities. Others have rights upon us. We need to fulfill these responsibilities so they can realize their rights. And if we don't do that, and we're busy with all other sorts of things that we have no impact upon, that do not concern us to begin with, then how is it then we're going to conduct, we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, fulfill people's rights? Right? So this is kind of the general paradigm understanding of the need. And I think, you know, in, in the difficult times that we face now, uh, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, um, it's important we get back to the basics. Um, and the basics, yes, indeed, is the Qur'an and Sunnah, but the Qur'an and Sunnah speaks to us in a way where it's, it's imploring us to have uh, a grounding of how we see reality and how we view the universe and how we see ourselves, right? Some of the, the Sufi masters, they would say, when Arafa nafsah wa Arafa rabbah, whoever knows themselves, then will know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're kind of a microcosm of the universe. You know, they refer to the, the universe as the al-alim al-kabir, some of them and the human being as the alim al the macrocosm, which is everything around us, and then the microcosm, which is when we look into our own selves. So in a sense, we can contain the universe. Our hearts can contain the universe. You know, the Hadith of Qudsi, which is kind of ambiguous and mysterious at the same time, that the heavens and the earth cannot encompass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the heart of the believer can. What does that mean? Right? Because we're not talking here quantitatively, we're talking qualitatively. Right? In other words, we are the sole creatures that have been endowed with this faculty of knowing. We can know things. We can learn things. We can appreciate things. We can read signs into things. Right? We can take action based upon principle. Right? Mabda. And ethics and morals. Other creatures, they do so based upon instinct. Right, which is also God given. We call it instinct, but it's really the fitrah. Right? The fitrah Allah fakr al nasa ali. This is the fitrah that both people and the creatures have been given. In the way that they behave instinctually, and you know, the sparrow knows how to go and find the, the worms uh, as it leaves its nest in the morning, then it comes back and feeds its, its young sparrow chicks by regurgitating the food, putting it in its mouth. Did its mother teach it to do that? No, it's something that it knows instinctually, right? Or the salmon that, that swim upstream every year. Instinctually they do that. You know, or, or the leatherback turtles that come to the, 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 the sea coast and, and plant, uh, uh, lay their eggs, right? And bury them and come back later and find the eggs and hatch of the little turtles. All those things are done uh, instinctually. Much in the same way that the moon and the stars and the sun, they do what they do instinctually. So, um, you know, it's a burden upon us that we have to, just as there's an ordered world around us that Allah has given his fitrah to, he has also given a fitrah to us, but he has also given us this element of choice and of desire and of wants. And unless we regulate those things to fit into the order of Allah's universe, right, then we will not cause order, we will cause disorder, we will cause chaos. We're the only creatures that really can bring evil into the world and bring chaos into the world. We have the ability to do that. So we don't say that animals are evil. 
We don't say that this particular place is evil, right? It's by virtue of the people who are in it who make it that way, right? But here, you know, the, the land of uh, Pleasanton and Malapetus and uh, what are the other towns around Fremont and, and, the, and the San Andreas Fault and the mountains and all these things around it, those are all God's creation, right? There's nothing inherently that's somehow more sacred here, so to speak, than say in Morocco. But it's by virtue of the people in Morocco, the practice of Islam in Morocco, the dhikr of the people of Morocco over centuries that give this sort of added sacredness to those places, right? Or when Allah designates a place as being sacred. But, uh, you know, inherently everything is sacred. The whole universe is sacred, right? Sacred means that there's an inviability to it. There's like a higher meaning to it because of the one who put it there, namely Allah So, that was kind of the second introduction, um, completion of one yesterday. So now we'll, we'll get into uh, the, the, the second off, uh, inshallah. So I called it Theology, Law, and Ethics. I'm not sure if you guys can see it. Over there, um, understanding the Islamic uh, paradigm. So, as I said, we're looking at foundational issues. So, the first thing that I think um, kind of that one needs to familiarize oneself with is, as we said, we're the sole creatures that can know things, and the way that we articulate the things that we know. Right, the Greeks refer to the human being as the rational animal. Uh, the Muslim uh, philosophers after that refer to us as al-haywan and nadiq the articulating or pronouncing animal. In other words, that creature that can articulate and share its thoughts with its own kind. And language then is uh, essential. Because via language, we can talk about what's in our head and the conceptions that we can have. And if we are not square on the language, if we don't understand what is actually meant by a particular word, right, um, then it's very easy to find oneself committed to a concept, a philosophy, a thought. And if they would take a deeper look at it and see what the words are actually saying, they would say, no, I don't agree with that. And this is kind of the, the catch-22, the trap Muslims also find themselves in. Right? People will be like, um, you know, we would say something like, uh, you know, for us marriage is between a man and a woman and we don't really have this man, man, or woman, woman thing. Then someone would say to us, well, don't you believe in freedom? Are you guys against freedom? And you're like, um, no, but, uh, and then we don't want to say after that. Freedom is a load of work, right? Uh, don't you believe in progress? Like if you say, well, this is something we, we, we inherited, it's our tradition. It's one of the prophets of our Senate from, you know, 1400 years ago. Well, don't you believe in progress? What is this tradition you're talking about? Things progress, things change. You've got to progress. Things are progressive, things develop. Don't you believe in development? Don't you believe in progress? And so, all of these words are loaded terms. And they have what we call a particular cognitive frame. In other words, when we evoke these words, we're not just evoking a singular word. We're talking about a historical narrative. We're talking about uh, civilization. We're talking about um, history. And it's not just something I go look up in Webster's Dictionary and I look up freedom and it means to... No. It's way bigger than that. And so many of these ways of, that we're being attacked and, 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 and confronted, let's say not attacked, but confronted with these things, we have to be aware, well let's be aware of the cognitive frame that you're talking about before we make a commitment to something. Before I say I'm committed to sustainable development, for example. Where did that word come from to begin with? Where did that concept come from? Right? Many Muslims say, yeah, yeah, sustainable development, definitely. Well, slow down. What's development to begin with? What's growth? What is that? Where did that come from? There's an idea that 
states, nation states should be economically in a state of perpetual growth, right? Your GDP has to increase three, four, five, six, seven percent every year. Otherwise, you know, you're considered to be a state that is not as developed as it should be. But then if you think about it, well, if I, how, how am I supposed to sustain uh, consistent perpetual growth when resources are finite? Doesn't it mean that if I'm cons consistently growing, that someone else is supplying that growth and then they're not growing? Isn't there kind of a push and pull aspect here or no? So we have to sort of, um, you know, uh, deconstruct. You know, it's very popular today to deconstruct everything. We need to deconstruct deconstructionism. <laughs> you know, the idea that we're deconstructing everything, that idea itself, where did that come from? Right? The idea that we feel the need to pull everything apart, right, and remove any intent of the authors behind it. Right? You know, deconstructionism in language means, well, the author's intent is not important here. It's whatever it means to me. And that is uh, a method, right? Foucault and Derrida and the rest of them, that's how they see the world. You deconstruct everything, and the author's intent means nothing. So they'll look at the Qur'an, for example, and say, it doesn't matter what Allah meant here, it's what it means to me. And you can obviously see the issue you would have with something like that. So, um, you know, language, meanings, principles, these cognitive frames inform the way that people speak about the world today. And we need to be careful with, with the terms. We need to be careful with terms like progress and development and freedom. Even sexuality. Right? What's sexuality? That's a new term. People think it's like been around for centuries. People didn't used to talk like that. Even the word heterosexual, it's a new thing. Heterosexual, less than 100 years ago, 70, 80 years ago, meant someone that was hypersexual. In other words, they had a, a, a you know, a, they were an infomaniac, they were someone who had a heightened, uh, you know, above normal uh, need for, for sexual intercourse. That was heterosexual. There was no word called homosexual. That's a word that has been introduced. Just in the past three years, I think, this word heteronormativity is another word that's been introduced. Right? What's heteronormative? People heard that word before? Anybody? Heteronormative? Never heard that? This is a word that's in the university. Heteronormative means you believe that the normal sexual relationship is between people of the opposite sex. That makes you heteronormative. What about cisgender? Have you heard that one? Anyone heard cisgender? CIS, gender? You guys don't read or what? So. You've heard of transgender, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cisgender would be someone who's not transgender. In other words, what we would call normal, there's a word for them. Why? Because when you establish the dichotomy, you're establishing a new normal. So when I say heterosexual versus homosexual, then I make both of them acceptable, right? And instead of one just being the normal or what's normative. So when I say something is heteronormative, right, that means you have a particular method, way of looking at the world that is not universal. We can look at the world differently, and so forth. See how the language then is manipulated, the language of the terms are being redefined in order to advance a particular philosophy behind those words. That's why language is, you know, Muslims should be the best at language, the strongest, right? In both our Arabic language, right, because this is how we understand the deen, and also the words that others use to describe certain things that are going to be problematic for us. So these language meanings and principles, the cognitive frame, we have to be aware of it. So, for example, as I said earlier, today, if you say, I do one, two, three, because um, this is our tradition, in the popular discourse, that's an unacceptable argument. Why? Because it contravenes the overriding concept in our discourse, which is the idea of progress. So, progress means just because people did something 50 years ago that way, mean, doesn't mean it's right today. And in fact, 
Most likely, the way they were doing it 50 years ago means it's wrong. And then we've progressed. And then the way we're going to do it today is better. Right? And so the, the notion of progress assumes that there's a linear uh, sort of uh, incline. So we are progressing. As we are progressing technologically, we are also going to progress morally and ethically. This was the promise of the Enlightenment. This is what they postulated. As we begin to learn new things about the universe and discover things, and we remove what was referred to the church by mysteries, right? The church had the doctrine of mystery. Like, how is it that people are born and, 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 and the child looks something like the mother and something like the father? Church would say, well, God works in mysterious ways. Scientists said, no, it's not mystery, we figured it out. There's a human genome, uh, the child inherits DNA from both the mother and the father, and the combination of that DNA will have certain features of the mother and certain features of the father. And there's no mystery. And so when we remove the mystery, then we don't need God anymore. This is what Stephen Hawking refers to as the God of the gaps. There's a gap in our understanding and our knowledge. Because we don't know how something works, we haven't figured it out yet, then we just put God there to, to explain it. I don't know how that thing works. God works for us. Leave it. And so he said, well, eventually, we'll get to a point where we remove all of the God caps. And then it will be pure knowledge and we have no reason for God anymore. Because we figured out how everything works. The problem with that, from a philosophical standpoint, is just because you know how something works doesn't mean that you can create it. Right? Just because you've been given insight into what's behind that thing doesn't mean that you know it. Right? And it doesn't mean that you know it from all its aspects. You know it from a particular vantage point. But you know it from all of its vantage points. So the physicists, like Hawkins, or the scientists, they want to remove any metaphysical foundation and aspect to this. Because metaphysical means outside of the physical. In other words, there's spirit behind it. There are means behind it. There are inward aspects to it that cannot be perceived only outwardly. And so they said, no, 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 that's, that has to go away. We don't want any of that. So hence, the God of the gaps. Right? Hence the idea of the theory of everything, the meta-narrative, that we will have an outward explanation for all of these things. And this is where it's going. Here in this place, Silicon Valley, right? where is the Google place? It's not far from here, right? Do you know what they're doing over there, spending billions of dollars on? They're thinking about how to implant a chip in your brain Right? So that information can be downloaded directly and it'll expand your memory capacity. And even the next logical progression after that is the idea of what's human consciousness. If I can download your whole brain into a microchip, why can't I put that in somebody else? And then they assume your consciousness. Because all that is based upon the outward. Right? That all we have, all we are are these physical entities. And that means physical entities can be manipulated, and we can you know, move somebody's brain to this place over here. But there's no intonation or understanding that there's an inward aspect to that. That we're not just bodies, right? In the academic discourse today, and even the popular discourse, people are, refer are being increasingly referred to as bodies, right? Black bodies, brown bodies, white bodies, they want to hurt these bodies. Are we just bodies? Or are we something more than that? Right? Human being is more than just the body. That's what you see on the outside. But there's a soul there. right? There's a basic intrinsic humanity. A living, breathing life force right? that informs this body, but it's not just the body. And so that particular philosophy then, if it's only the outward, this is what's driving and fueling what's going happening today. Right, the idea of uh, people talking about AI, artificial intelligence, and you know, you find in the popular culture, um, Star Trek and, and series like that. Well, is the artificial in, in, intelligence being a being or not a being? Right? Is it does it is it sentient? Does it have rights? Right? Or does it not have rights? Or is it a machine? Is it more like a human or more like a machine? You know, and, and you'll find the episode with. Uh, Star Trek Next Generation, John Luke Picard, and that android. Uh, anyone watch that? No? This is 
Just give me back slide. <laughs> anyway, the Android thing argues for its uh, its right to be treated as a human being and not as a machine, not as somebody's property, right? Because it has aspects of it that are human-like. And so humanity then is reduced to the idea of certain experiences, right? So someone has a sexual experience, well, and it's a machine, well, then maybe then it can be treated as a human being, or should be treated like a human being. And actually, this is an issue coming up in Far East Asia, right, where there's a, everyone put, put their uh, hands over the ears of young kids. There's a <laughs> sex doll industry there, right, and it's growing. And now there's some controversy because people want to actually do dolls of children. And then what is the ethical quandary that you find in that? Because well, it's still a doll, it's a piece of property, but it's depraved, right? So how, how, do you, how do you handle that? Because again, I think it's all part of the general theme that our humanity has been reduced to this mere physical type of presence, and it's no more than that, right? Um, and that brings a whole other set of issues, the idea of, of, of what governs behavior and etiquette, which is a whole other thing that we're not going to get into here, but uh, the social justice class will talk a little bit about that. So uh, I'm being told that we're at the break time, and we're still on the first slide, so that's a good progress. <laughs> uh, but um, just I'll leave you with uh, just two points before we break. Um, all of these words that I just mentioned, keep in mind that what we have, uh, it's called an intellectual genealogy. Right? It came from somewhere. The word progress, development, sexuality, all these words came from somewhere and were introduced into the discourse. They haven't always been there, so don't make the assumption they've always been there. Also, we have our own terms too, right? We have our own intellectual genealogy, genealogies for our terms, and they're not always reconcilable with these other terms. That's why translation is a tricky business. So, when we talk about the word baraka, for example, and it's used in the Qur'an, right? Or baraka, or baraka min you know, there's the baraka around Beit al -Maqdis. I can't really translate that. We sometimes use blessing, we sometimes use these other words, but, you know, as a foundational concept, the idea that there's barakah, that Allah will put sort of an extra meaning in something not based upon its quantity, but rather based upon its quality. Because that's the origin of the word. Um, that the, the caravan travelers, they used to have this little patch, a little sack, satchel that they take with them, that was called a birka. Birka also means small body of water. And it said that it didn't have that much water in it, but when they go out into the desert, and they're on the caravan, and going far distances, they're hoping there's a lot of baraka in it, because if you run out of water in the middle of the desert, right, so you want the water to last. So you're hoping that even in this small amount, Allah will extend, you know, uh, its capacity to, to, to sustain you, to sustain your life as you make your travel throughout. Right? And there, there we see kind of some of the secrets of the word, of the word baraka. Right? In the modern discourse, people hear the word baraka or blessing, and, then, and they may conjure it up to superstition. Oh, you think that place is what? Because there's some like spiritual vibe there or something that's better? Or, you know, it'll be dismissed. Because from their particular vantage point, their intellectual vantage point, that goes along with suspicion, uh, superstition. Not with this sacred idea of, of baraka and blessing that comes from the soul creator who makes it that way, right? Who extends life and meanings uh, into things even though they may appear outwardly as something that may not be carried or such thing. So we'll, uh, we'll continue after the break, inshallah. And just to reiterate the first slide, the idea of what's sometimes referred to as cognitive frames, or think of it as, uh, you know, to use a, uh, a popular concept, you know, in the movies now, with the superhero movies, they have the Marvel universe, right, where there's Thor and Iron Man and the whole. 
thing to have the DC universe, which is Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and Flash, right? So within each of those particular universes, there are kind of a, it's an enclosed system, right? And so they don't overlap Marvel with, with this other one. And so when you try to translate between them, you have to understand what's going on here and what's going on here, and the two systems don't necessarily correspond. So, you know, when we talk about uh, a word in Arabic that sometimes used for freedom, hurriya, versus freedom in, you know, this particular civilizational context, right? We don't, we don't use uh, hurriya like that. Usually when we use the word hurray, we're talking about someone who is hur versus someone who is abd. Someone who is um, not in a state of bondage, right? That would be a hur. This is what you find in the books of fit. And someone who is in a state of bondage. When we talk about the idea of, however, freedom to choose, which is what is being talked about in the Western civilizational context, the word that we generally use will be ikhtiyar. Ikhtiyar. That's significant. Why? Because ikhtiyar comes from the word khayr, which means good. So ikhtiyar then means would be to take the good, which means that when you choose, you're choosing the good. Right? We all know about salat al istikhar. What's salat al istikhar? This particular form, right? Yusuf knows from Saf. Form 10, right, it means talab, right, it means to request. So when you do istikhara, you're requesting the good. So when I, when I, when I do istikhara, when I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, astakhiruka, I am seeking for you to lead me to the good. So that means our freedom then, or our choice, in other words, to make choices, we are seeking the good. And it's not just freedom to choose whatever we want. This is how it's defined here. I am allowed to do whatever I desire. We don't have that really. Our cognitive frame, we don't really say that because if I'm allowed to do whatever I explicitly desire, then that may be something that is not good. That may be something that is harmful. That may be something that is even wrong. So there is moral uh, judgment attached to the choices that we make. And it's not just a mere choice. Whereas in this context, the Western Civilization context, no. Just being allowed to choose is the important thing, and being able to choose. So we're talking about two different ways of using the word choice, or freedom, when, when, we're, uh, when we're using the same words. So, just to further illustrate this point, at a very, very basic point, you know, Islam is referred to, like other religions, as a religion. That word in of itself is not different than progress, development, sexuality, in other words, we talked about. In other words, there's a historical narrative behind it, right? And deen doesn't really mean religion, when you say deen in Islam. This is different, right? Religion... Uh, in the post-reservation and post-enlightenment meant that it was something specific reduced to the practice of the individual. Like what religion are you? Right? What do you religiously do? What do you do consistently in terms of devotional acts? And that's people's concept of religion today. So, oh, you're Muslim, so you go to mosque on Friday. Oh, you're Jewish, you go to synagogue on Saturday and you observe the Sabbath and the Shabbat. Oh, you're a uh, Christian, you go to Mass or church on Sunday. And so there's this association with a religion being the sum of its ritual devotions, and what we call ibadat. But for us, it's not just ibadat. You can make an argument, ibadat is one-fourth one of religion. If you study any of the books of fiqh, if you study Ahyub, uh, Ibn Imam al-Ghazali, Right, the first quarter of the book is referred to as Robert Ibadat, the quarter of Ibadat, referring to ritual devotional acts. Well, what does the rest of it talk about? Other things, right? In the books of Fit, we'll talk, there's Mu'amalat, 
right? There is those things that are dealing with mu'amalat, min al ankiha wa talaq, you know, uh, family relationships, marriage, divorce, also commercial transactions, buying and selling and trading and loaning and investing, right? Bab al qarat. Most Muslims are probably not aware that there's something called the chapter dealing with investment in the books of fiqh. And it was dealt with a thousand years ago. And there are certain conditions that are applicable to it. So it's encompassing not just what we consider to be the ritual devotions. Then there's Bab al aqdiya wa shahadat Then there's the chapters dealing with uh, the functions of judgeship or a court or shahadat and testimony. Now we're definitely not talking about just ritual devotions. We're talking about something that extends even to uh, adjudicating between disputing parties. Right? We're talking about something that has a communal societal aspect to it. It's no longer just merely the sphere of the individual and what they choose to personally practice. And so the reason that we see, I think, a lot of clash oftentimes when people try to describe what Islam is because you can't really fit it into the box of religion. right? There was a time when uh, people wouldn't think, I'm in this religion. They would just say, this is what's normal. There's a God and we worship Him and we try to live our life according to the moral commands that we understand from Him. And that's kind of basically how the whole globe more or less lived up until quite recently. You didn't really have this idea of atheism previously, right? where people would deny God. Not even the Mushrikeen of Quraysh denied God. Right? And the Qur'an says, وَلِنْ سَأَتَّهُ مَنْ خَلَفَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يَقُولُنَّ اللَّهُ If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would say Allah. So they didn't deny that Allah is the creator of the universe. And they believed in Allah as the supreme creator of the universe, but they also associated other gods with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they weren't technically atheists in that they denied God. But they didn't have a proper understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even Satan is not an atheist, really. He just doesn't have a proper understanding, once again, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when he was asked to prostrate before Adam, and he refused, well, he knows that's Allah. He'd been worshipping him for thousands of years. But, he wasn't worshipping Allah as he should be worshipped. Because once he was tested, once he was put before the litmus test, and he said, Ana khayrun min. He said the word, I. And purportedly, he was the first creature to ever say, I, say, me, to look back at himself. So his worship was always about the I to begin with. It was always about him, and it wasn't about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when he refused to prostrate, then his lisan al-hal, right, the articulation of his heart was saying that Allah has wronged me. Allah, you are wronging me by asking me to prostrate. You did something wrong. And the kufr. Sarih, right? That is incompatible completely with the idea of the notion that we have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where his kufr came in. Not that he denied the existence of God, but rather he denied uh, the taqdis, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond any reproach and beyond any sense of that he can ever do anything that would be reproachable. This is what he, the problem he ran into. So this idea of ilhad or atheism, people just completely denying the existence of God, especially in our time, is kind of a little bit unprecedented, right, to a certain degree. Even the ancient Greeks believed in gods, or a god, some of them. Um, so religion then was a word that needed to be used to kind of, well, how do we define this very antiquated, inherited notion of life that people are still clinging on to, Right? And at the same time, use a word to describe it and not completely dismiss it because people are still following this idea. And so they said, well, let's call it religion. Right? In other words, something that you do as a worship practice and not something that informs all aspects, not just of your life, but civilizational and communal aspects. Like we said, politics, law, economics, ethics. All these things really came under the idea of um, deen. So for us, deen is not the same as religion. Deen encompasses all of these things, right? There's a popular khabar, the deen al-mu'amala, kama tadeenu tudan, how you are treated, you should treat others, so forth. So all of these 
kind of come in that it's it's much bigger than than the idea of of religion. So then trying to reconcile Islam with this new notion of what what religion is number one, that it's kind of reduced to just ritual worship. And at the same time, well how do we relate Islam to all these other aspects that we're talking about? Right? We talked about economics and ethics and politics and it seems to have a hand in it. Um, you know, and then the discourse assigned new words to people who had this notion that somehow it's beyond just personal worship. So they would call it fundamentalism, right? They would call it other words that were pejorative, that were negative, because they felt, well, your religion is supposed to be in your mosque or in your synagogue or in your church. You have really no business talking about economics and morality and ethics and, you know, social structures and things based upon your religion. This is problematic. This is not how we negotiate how societies are formed and how they are maintained. So, does that mean Islam is incompatible with the times that we're living in? No, it's not definitely not incompatible. But the notion of modernity, not living in modern times, are two different things, or living in contemporary times. Right? The overarching philosophy of the time we're living in is called modernity, right? which is all the things that I mentioned, the idea of progress and development, and everything is empirical, and, and everything is reduced to only its, its physical entity. That is all part of modernity. So if we want to say, well, is Islam okay with that? I would be like, no, we're not okay with that. It's definitely not okay with that. You know, the human being is not just some physical entity. So, you know, uh, Heidegger said that in modernity, man shapes his own reality. In other words, be yourself. And that's just the theme that we see. Right? Everybody's like, you be you and I be me and we'll get along. You just be, the, be who you are. The idea of self-love. Be who you are. Whatever that means. That's a very modern notion. Before it was, man discovers the reality. Know yourself. You are something to be discovered. In other words, it's not just that you're being. Your being is a gift from Allah. Your very existence is a gift from God. And if that is a gift from God, then I have to know more about this gift. Right? I have to think about this gift. I have to know myself. I have to discover the reality around me, rather than shaping the reality. And so, the idea of you shaping your own reality, or being yourself, you know, from an Islamic spiritual perspective, we would say that's very nafsani. That's very narcissistic and egoistic. The idea that you think uh, that this, all everything around you and your reality is something that can be shaped single-handedly by yourself. So it's a, whatever that you make of it. That's based upon the ego. Whereas when we say, know yourself, discover yourself, know the reality around you, know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the idea of ma'rifah, right? Because ma'rifah, knowing, is the essential active aspect of humanity, to know things. The Quranic verse Ibn Abbas said about it, وَمَا خَرْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not, not created the jinn and the human beings except that they may worship me. He said, إِلَّا لِيَعْرِفُونَ The meaning, yeah. Except that they may know me. Right? So that they may know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because worship then is the door to knowledge. Right? وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ Right? تَقُوا اللَّهِ Have God consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will give you knowledge. Allah will teach you. So it's a very different way of looking at everything around us. You know, I'm almost going to be myself, and I'm just going to fulfill my wants and my desires. And so the Muslim spiritual masters they would say that true liberation, right, uh, is not to exercise and do everything that you want. They said it's to want, not to want. In other words, you're liberated when your ego, when your desires are no longer controlling you, and then you move beyond them, right? And then your will becomes that one with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the very well-known hadith of Qudsi, right, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that 
there is nothing more beloved to me for my slave to perform except that which I have made obligatory upon him. And so then he will do or she will do the obligatory things. And then after the obligatory things, then they will do the nawaf. Then I will love him or her. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ كُنْتُ سَمْعُهُ وَبَصَرُهُ وَيَدَهُ And then if I love them, then I will be their hearing, their sight, their speech. And if they were to ask me, I would grant it to them. And if they seek refuge from you, then I will give them refuge. So there, there is a, it's a manhaj, right? It's, it's a program for actually how to become liberated, to become one with the divine will. In other words, the divine command and the divine will. What Allah commands you to is exactly what you are doing. That's the true liberation. That is to become free, right? Because when people say, well, I'm free. Free from what? What, is your, what are you seeking to be liberated from? Because when we talk about freedom, it means you're free from something. So what are you being free from? To me, in our, from my understanding of the Islamic tradition, it really, freedom is to be free from yourself. It's to be free from the confines of the lowest and most basic aspects of yourself. So we need to eat, we need to drink to survive. We need to procreate for the species to survive. And those are basic aspects of the human soul, of the human condition. But if they are allowed to be exercised unchecked, in a sense that's all you're about, right? Because human beings naturally have a strong inclination for those three things, right? It's very basic to us because it's about survival, really. Because if you don't eat, you don't drink, you don't procreate, either you don't survive as an individual or the species doesn't survive. So there are strong inclinations, but at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while He has made that inherent within, within us, um, He has also given us another aspect of our humanity, the angelic side. Right? When Allah spoke to the angels, and He told them, إِنِّي خَالِقُ بَشَرُ الْمِنْتِينَ فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِ I am creating Bashar, right? And Bashar is different than Insan. It's a different vantage point. Insan min al-uns, it's kind of referring to the uh, social, spiritual aspect of the human being, right? That he needs to be amongst others, right? Wanas, uns, Insan, those are all the meanings. Amma al-Bashar, min al-Bashar, from the actual physical aspect, this is called Bashar, the skin. Right? So we're skin and flesh and bones. So when he says to the angels, Inni khalikun basharam min teen, I am creating this bashar, in other words, the physical aspect, he's just physical now, min teen, from clay. But that's not why he's significant. Right? The verse doesn't stop there. فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Right? But if I fashion him and I form him, form him, تَسْوِيهِ and what else? وَنَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Right? And then I give him something of the spirit, ruhi. Doesn't mean Allah's spirit, but the spirit that is divine in origin and that it came from Allah. He created it. فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Then you are to prostrate before him. Not because he's clay. This is what Satan didn't get. Right? Satan didn't mention the نَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ part. What did he say? He stopped at He didn't hear the rest of it. You claim from clay, well, in our qiyas, in our analogy, clay is less than fire. So how is it then that he's better than me? That's not why he's better than you. Yeah, please, la'anak Allah. Read the rest of it. Come to the rest of the verse. فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ If I form him, Right? And in some of the hadith of Qudsiyyah, إِنَّ Allah خَلَقَ آدَمْ عَلَى سُورَتِهِ وَعَلَى سُورَةِ الرَّحْمَانِ That man was created in, in, in God's image. Does that mean something anthropomorphic? No. It means that something of the meanings, the high divinity, the idea of knowledge and of power and of will and of hearing and seeing, which are divine attributes, 
We share in the sense that we use the same words to define those attributes within us, but that's where the similarity ends. But that's enough of a significance, right, that makes us significant, that makes us important. This is what it means, that there's something of a reflection of the divine within a human being, or a manifestation of the divine will and the divine word. When he wants something to be, he says, be and it is. We're the, we're the recipients of that, as is the rest of the universe. This is what Iblis didn't see. All he saw was the clay. He saw the outside. Right? He just saw the outward aspect. But the angels understood, because they're angels. He wasn't an angel. He's a jinn. Right? He has the ability to choose, like us. But the angels perceive the tajalliyat like that. They don't have another way, right? They do what they are commanded to do because they are purely spiritual creatures. So when they were told that, All of them prostrated except Iblis, who wasn't an angel, but he was amongst them because he was like them in terms of his outward worship. He worshipped like an angel, but he wasn't an angel. So, this is why the human being then is significant. That we have this ruh, right? And this is what, this is the illah, this is why the angels were asked to prostrate before us. Not a prostration of worship, but what's called a prostration of ta'zim, right? You're, you're making ta'zim, you're declaring that which Allah declares as great, you are declaring as great by fulfilling that divine command. So, the reality of the human being then is, yes, there's this bestial aspect to it, but that's not what makes you human, because you share that with the rest of the animals. That's why the Qur'an compares those who use those two faculties and those who don't use those faculties. Right? Right? Do they not have hearts by which they can understand with? Do they not have eyes which they see with? Do they not have ears by which they uh, hear with? These people are like the an'am. They're like the beasts of burden, like the animals, because they don't use that which is unique for them. Benhum Allah. Rather, they are worse. They are more misguided than the animals, because we don't describe mis animals as misguided. We don't describe them as guided or misguided. They do exactly what Allah wants them to do, unless human being interferes. So that makes them worse than the beasts of burden, than the animals, because they're not using the faculties that Allah has endowed them with. And so when you ignore your angelic spiritual aspect of your humanity, of your condition, you're worse than the animal. And you become reduced to an animal. Human beings do things to themselves and to others when they ignore that aspect that are unimaginable. Right? We rape, we pillage, we kill, we spill blood. Some people eat other people. All sorts of things you can't even imagine beyond. So depraved. Right? And you wonder, how, how can someone do that? Well, when they're reduced to their physical aspect, they're worse than an animal. It's an insult to an animal to say that person is acting like an animal. Animals do what they're supposed to do. This is worse. They are like the animals, nay, they are even worse than they are. So, if we define then freedom, liberation as freedom to do whatever you want, that is not in line with our understanding of humanity. No, we want to be free from doing whatever we want. If it's based upon our bestiality, we want to do what Allah wants. That's the true liberation. But in this particular paradigm, cognitive frame of the West, well, that sounds like subjugation. That sounds like you don't have your own autonomy. That sounds like you're just following tradition based upon their historical narrative. But based upon ours and the Hadith al Qudsi that I just mentioned, right? That means everything that you do will be conveyed via the divine, right? And the best human being, the one who is the epitome of all this, Allah, the Prophet said that he, he, he lives that meaning, he displays it. What other human being does Allah speak about in the Quran when he says, وَلَا سَوْفَ يَعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ Right, and your Lord will give you I give you, فَتَرْضَى مَنْ يَرْضَى هُنَا Who is the one who is going to be pleased? Huh? The Prophet. The Prophet, the Prophet So your Lord will give you and you will be pleased 
Usually we think of the opposite, right? I will give and then Allah will be pleased. No. When He reaches the epitome, He will give you and you will be pleased. That's why some of them, they said, هَذِهِ أَرْجَى آيَةِ الْقُرْآنِ This is the most hopeful verse in the Qur'an. To give the believers the most hope. Some of them said, وَاتَّقُ النَّارَ الَّتِي عُدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِ Some of them said, and fear the fire, the one that has been prepared for the disbelievers. In other words, not for the believers. So, that gives us hope. Fire is not meant for us. It's not supposed to go there. But they said, أَرْجَى مِنْ هَذِي وَلَا سَوْفَ يَعْمُ that Allah will give you and you will be pleased. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ especially, he would not be pleased with any single member of his ummah entering into hellfire. He doesn't want that for any one of his ummah. And the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is all the people who lived after him. Not just those who accepted Islam and those who didn't. Everybody. So he would not want for anyone to enter into and so if Allah is going to please him, right, and Allah will give him, then he will not be pleased with anyone entering into hellfire. That's the problem. That's what I said. Khayr al khalq, right? The, the best of creation is the Prophet Muhammad a human being, right? But not like other human beings, right? Remember the word of Nufi and the Russian, they say, Kal Rashi, Kal Yakutu Bain Hajar, right? As Imam Basiri says, and that which we read in, in knowledge is that he is a human being, but not like other human beings, like the ruby amongst the regular stones. So, essentially, Islam cannot be reduced. Freedom of liberation is about liberating from yourself rather than liberating from what you think to be societal strictures or patriarchy or. Um, you know, what could conjure to be uh, uh, to you and, 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 uh, and obstacles around you to achieve particular worldly goals. We're not saying that those things don't exist. They indeed exist, but if you want true liberation to really be free, you can never free yourself from all of the societal obstacles around you. It's always going to be something. Right? That's why even a person in bondage, right, a slave, can be free inside. Because they've liberated themselves in another way, even though from a physical aspect, they're not liberated, they're in bondage. And then that person who thinks they are free, right? All of these high rollers in the Silicon Valley that you have here, and Jeff Bezos worth 100 billion now, and I don't think he's free. I don't think that makes him free. I think that makes him very um, unfree. I think it's a type of prison of itself. Right? Uh, but true freedom is to be content with the circumstances Allah has given you and not desirous of more. Right? I don't think Jeff Bezos is happy with the hundred billion. He wants more than a hundred billion. He wants Amazon to be bigger than it is. He wants Amazon to, to you know, have all of these businesses go out of business and Amazon is, everybody buys everything from Amazon. If he had his way, there would be no more malls, there would be no more uh, brick and mortar stores, and everyone would buy everything from Amazon. <coughs> Wouldn't he want that? Wouldn't that be okay with him? And if Google had its way, then there would no, be no other search engines than Google. And if Facebook had its way, I think internet traffic is already like 75% of Facebook. You know, they'd be very happy with 90% or 100%. People want to know other internet sites except Facebook, and the sites that they advertise for. That's where we can find with them too. Because that's what they see. They don't see the aspects of the community and society around them. Compare that to the traditional Muslim perspective, for example, on commercialism and commercial transactions. Look at the way that Muslim markets were set up. The way that Muslim markets were set up in traditional Muslim cities is that people who were selling the same thing, they would be co-located in the same place. And not just co-located, they would actually form a type of commercial brotherhood called the guild. So all of the silversmiths are in one place, all the blacksmiths are in one place, all of the butchers are somewhere else, together. Right? All of the linen and, and, and uh, uh, cotton sellers are in one place. Uh, to the degree that, I've seen this personally, I've witnessed it. I, I lived in Damascus in the late 90s. And I went to buy, uh, you know, they have this very intricate... Uh, uh, 
tablecloths, dining dining table cloths that you can buy. Souq al Hamidiyah, which is right next to the Umumi Mosque. And so I went to the section of the souq where it was like maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 stores like that. So I went to one person, I asked him, uh, do you have this particular one I'm looking for? He said, I don't have it now, today, but why don't you go, I'll walk you down to the person next to me, I know the person who has it. Yeah. I'm like, what? You're going to take me to He said, yeah. Because uh, I'm thinking, well, if, you know, if I went to a store here in the States and they said, oh, we don't have it, they'll say, come back tomorrow, or come back the next day, and he would go get it and mark up the price on that thing and then sell it to me. He, he could have done that. Right? He could have said, I'll oh, come back tomorrow, I'll have it for you. And he could have procured it from his supplier, and he would have got the profit for that. And then that would have been it. Right? And there's stories of friends of mine who've, who've actually went and they say, well, I've made enough money for today, why don't you go to my neighbor, he, he didn't sell a lot today. Why don't you buy from him? Right? So there's these particular frames, this thing called market share. Right? Any of you who studied business and economics, there's only so much market share and you want to have as much as of it as you can. And so it becomes sort of a zero-sum game. So if I'm not getting 10, 20% of the market share, that means someone else is getting it, right? And it's, you know, it's confined to looking at the world that the places are so finite and the barakah is so limited that we all have to compete for it. That's not how we see risk, right? That risk min Allah. And the treasuries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never run out. So it's not limited by any stretch of the imagination, right? This market share concept that you, you know, you tyrannize people with, we don't subscribe to that, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can decide that this is your risk, right? This is what you will get. But when you have an overarching philosophy that is not based upon the divine, it's not based upon Allah, and it's based upon just getting everything that you can possibly get without any sort of consideration for anyone else, of course you're going to see facet. Of course you're going to see corruption. Of course you're going to see misery. Right? Of all those things that we get very cheaply on Amazon, and I have to admit that, you know, I'm in a, a bookstore and then I see the title and then I scan the barcode and I see on Amazon, it's usually much less expensive. And it's just easier just to click and you get it from Amazon two days later rather than buying from the store. Right? It's by design. It's done that way. Right? The convenience aspect of it is by design, so you don't buy from that store. Why do you think they have the, the camera and you can take the image of the barcode while you're in the store so that you can see what Amazon sells it for? It's by design to take away you know, uh, any aspect of, 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 of looking for something other than Amazon. Even the Facebook, right? Zuckerberg has a team of psychoanalysts on, on his team. And so when they design certain things on Facebook, they design it so it appeals to the lowest cognitive factor in the human being. So I think it was maybe seven or eight years ago, they introduced the, the Facebook like. Before that, there, were, there wasn't a like. You'd have to write a comment. Right? And they said, well, we want a higher level of engagement with Facebook. And we want people to feel that when they put a post, that someone is noticing and so if people are burdened with having to write a comment every time, well, that's too much. There must be another way. So they said, yeah, we can do the like button. Right? So if someone just says, clicks like, then it means they noticed your post and, you know, you've engaged with them. And then their psychoanalysts tell them, well, actually, you know, you had it in blue color. Why don't you make it in red color? Because when you make it in red, there's going to be an associated dopamine uh, level rise when you do it with red instead of blue, because people will react to the red. And so when they open their Facebook page and they see, oh, 27 messages, right, it's like, you know, an addict going back and getting a high, oh, I have to re-engage, right, and you reload the page every 10 minutes or 15 minutes or maybe less to see, oh, how many more likes did I get? You think, oh, that's coincidence? That's by design, right? They are studying the worst aspect of who we are the aspects that can fall into addiction, right? That will have certain chemical release in our brains so that we can further engage. And for what purpose? To what end? For our betterment? For our good? No. For what? To line their pockets. That's the reason. For them to make more money. For them to make the maximum amount of profit. That's all the only reason. 
And so, if that's how that system works, right, then no wonder, you know, we're seeing that now that people are getting their news from Facebook, and they're not even getting it from traditional news sources, and now you have this proliferation of what's called fake news, and the idea of echo chamber, and that people will only see on their news feed people that agree with them. They don't really engage. Facebook is not a community, right? Community doesn't mean that you're only with like-minded people who see the world exactly the same way that you see it. When you live in a physical community, right, you're going to have people from different perspectives, different ways of looking at life, and that interaction with one another is what enriches the community. But nowadays, people have increasingly lower level of tolerance for opposing viewpoints. They can't, because they've been conditioned to live in this particular, what they call, echo chamber. So it's just people echoing what you want to hear. The same thing that you're saying, they're saying it. And so, you know, even our traditional news sources have followed suit. Just open one day, open Fox News one day and MSNBC News another day and compare how they treat the same story. Right? Fox News, Trump is a saint. MSNBC, Trump is the Antichrist. No exaggeration. That's how it develops. That's how they portray things. Because they're dealing with people who are their constituencies. They're not informing anymore, right? They are appealing to their customers. And then people start speaking in terms of, well, this is hot, this is truth, and this is not. And even in the Muslim world, same thing. Open a Jazeera on one channel, and open an Arabiya on another channel, right? Or Saudi News on another channel, and you'll see the difference. The same exact thing, talking about the same incident but from completely different perspectives. And then people believe, oh, that's my team. I'm on the Jazeera Qatar team. Or I'm on the Arabia UAE Saudi team. And so I'm going to listen to this one versus listening to this one. But at the end of the day, everyone is a customer and everybody's being manipulated. And the reality that they're trying to sell in you is an orchestrated one. It's not a sort of reflection of how things actually are. Because how things actually are, sometimes you can't actually know how things actually are. Maybe nobody knows yet. Maybe there isn't a clear-cut answer to the things that you're looking for. But that's not newsworthy. No one wants to say that. So it just must be easier to sell you, this is the orchestrated reality. This is what it is. And this is what's happening in this country, this is happening in this country, this is what's happening in your neighborhood, and so forth. So I think part of being Muslim is to be why. Right? In the popular culture, we say being woke, right? But not being woke just to um, social maladies, but being woke to the idea that there are people vying for our attention and vying for our engagement, and they do not have our best interest at heart. And even those who, 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 you know, who, uh, who say that they're heads of these type of social causes and so forth, they also want a type of engagement from you, right? Even though it may seem noble. So, we need to reclaim our minds, you know, reclaim the heart, yes, but reclaim your intellect as well. And don't just buy into everything because it's being presented to you as this is the way it is, this is the reality. Right? The Muslim should be more discerning and should wait and see and have what's called ta'enni and tarayyuth, you know, to, to be deliberate, to get, to, if there's something, action needs to be taken, make sure before you step, that you know what's going on, and don't just jump into the fray. Right? If you see two people fighting out on the sidewalk, and the being one is beating the other, or one, you know, they're fighting one another, how can I step into the fight? I don't know who's who's doing what. You know, the most I can think about maybe is stop the fight if they're fighting. But to jump on one side versus the other, on what basis? I don't know the, the history behind. It. I don't know what's going on. So, um, yeah. I don't know how we got onto that tangent, but uh, we'll move on to the next slide. So, this we have touched on a little bit, so we'll move quickly. So, for us, the nature of the human condition, rather than the world, is that the real is not limited to the physical. So. In short, that which we can perceive, yes, is indeed the world, and we believe that that thing exists regardless of our perception of it or not. That things can exist regardless if I can perceive it or not. So if I say, for example, um, 
How many of these people have been to Vietnam? Anyone? Ho Chi Minh City, nobody? How many people have a doubt that it exists? No one has a doubt about it? It's not a big conspiracy? Why do you believe that? You didn't see it. You weren't there. But yet, in your heart, you have no doubt that it exists. Why? Because you've heard about it from so many different sources in so many different ways that you don't need to actually perceive it to know that it's there. So we can perceive things being there, right, and know it in our heart like we know something right in front of us. Seeing is believing, true. But some, not seeing doesn't mean not believing either. And that's part of our, our, our metaphysical, as I said earlier, underpinning. I don't necessarily have to perceive it to know that it's there. There's other ways, then, of knowing something exists. And the reason we emphasize this point is because modernity tells us that, no, actually, you have to be able to perceive it to know that it exists. Otherwise, call it something else. Don't call it knowledge. Call it faith. That's nice. You believe in angels and God. Okay, very nice. But that's your faith. That's not knowledge. Versus the Islamic paradigm that tells us to know Allah. Know that there is nobody except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was addressed to the Prophet but it's applicable to all of us. We need to know it. So real then is not limited to the physical, but it's also on other planes, other awali. Right? The Fatiha says, Alhamdulillahi Rabb wa al alamin Right? Which is the plural of alam. But it's, uh, it's a unique plural, because usually that form of plural, we use it for what's called al-atib, or Jeremiah Muzakir said. In other words, something that is sentient, that has sense. So we can say, al-mutakallimun, uh, al-harifun, uh, al-hamidun, al-sabihun, so forth. These are all Jeremiah Muzakir said, which means, a group of people who know, a group of people who study a Dari Sun, a group of people who uh, make Tasbih and Musabbihun, and when it's non-human sort of plural, we don't usually use that form. We use another form. We might use Jama'al Mu'annaf, or we could use what's called Jama'al Taqseer, like the word Awalim. Awalim is similar to Alameen, but it's, it's more uh, standard. So this is a non-standard plural. So it gives an indication, right? Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all of the different worlds, right? That there are sentient worlds, little world, worlds that are atim, that you may not be able to perceive. Like the world of what? The, world of the angels, right? They're atim, right? They are sentient. And some have said that even the animals themselves have a type of atal or sentience, but it's imperceived, imperceptible to man. We can't understand it. Right? There's nothing in the world except There's nothing in creation that hymns the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except you cannot understand those praises. You don't understand the language way that they praise. You don't understand when the whales are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the bottoms of the ocean, you think they're just making sounds. But maybe they're actually praising, making the speak of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So perception is not the whole game, it's part of it only. So um, Maybe people need to get ready for the horse for the loop and stuff like that in that event. So we'll stop here, inshallah, and resume after the horse and lunch at 2 o'clock. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidu al-Anbiya wa al-Musaleen. Sayyidu al-Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'ad. So um, we'll resume where we left off. Inshallah, just to reiterate the previous slide. We said that uh, the nature of our reality in the world is that it, there are things that are imperceptible by the senses, but nevertheless are real. 
And then there are things that are perceptible by the senses, obviously, and are as weird as well. So what follows from this is that there must be a manner by which for us to appreciate that which is real, but at the same time outside of the perception of the senses. Otherwise, how could we be held responsible for affirming its reality or its realness if we didn't have the means to do so? All right? So, um, when we affirm things of the unseen to be real, right, then we have to use another method, another way, another epistemological means by which to know that it's real. And this is what's called manat taklif This is why we are held ethically and morally accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because if he gives us the means by which to appreciate and discern and understand these truths, um, and then we have these means, but we fail to use them or we choose to ignore them, then at that point we can be held accountable. But if we don't have the means to begin with, then we're not accountable. So the, the prepubescent child, um, the person who's sleeping, the unconscious person, the insane person, clinically insane person, all of these people are not held accountable because either temporarily or in that particular state that they're in, they are not aware right, of their senses, they're not using what has been given to them by which to discern truth and reality and, uh, and falsehood from, from truth, namely al or the intellect. And in some of the akhbar, it's mentioned that the first thing that Allah created was al First thing that it created was the intellect, the ability to perceive and know beyond just sensory perception. So when we're talking about things beyond sensory perception, then there's kind of four concepts that really we have to work with in order to get out a kind of, a, I would say, understanding of, of how all that works. So the four that you see before you, intellect, knowledge, truth, and reason. So the Muslim scholars, they define uh, knowledge or in idraq ala ma huwa ali. Knowing something as it, it exists in reality. And that sounds pretty simple, pretty basic, pretty intuitive. But if you compare it with some of these postmodernist philosophies that would say that there is no reality outside of your perception. In other words, if you can perceive it, it's real. If you can't perceive it, then it can't possibly be real. So we say knowledge, though, is to be able to realize it, to perceive it, either by your senses or another means as it exists in reality. In other words, there's an extra mentality to reality. So extra mentality to reality means that it's not just in my head, or your head, or anybody else's head. It's actually a true entity that exists, regardless of whether I can perceive it or I can realize it or not, or anyone else. And that's Again, it sounds like very basic, very intuitive, but some of these postmodernist philosophies will, will posit the opposite, that uh, reality is only perception. And if you can't perceive it, then how can you prove to me that it's real, hence it's not real? And we'll talk about that in a little bit, about countering that particular argument. So, This is called the ilm in the Islamic paradigm. Uh, sometimes this is contra uh, contrasted with ma'rifa. Sometimes they're used interchangeably. Uh, sometimes they're not. If there's a difference between them, what is the difference? Ma'rifa sometimes refer to knowing something in as much as you have the ability to know it by the signs of it. So when we talk, for example, sort of a spiritual knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't say al-alim billah. Right, because if we, if if alim is idraku shay alam huwa ali, it's understanding something, realizing it as it actually is. Well, we don't have the ability to do that with Allah subhanahu wa taala. La yalam Allah illa Allah. So what does Allah ask us to know? Fa'alam nahu la ilaha illa Allah. That's different, right? Knowing la ilaha illa Allah is not the same thing as knowing Allah. So la ilaha illa means there is no God, deity worthy of worship except Allah. So, precisely, you are affirming His existence. 
and that there is none like him, right? Saying that there's none like him, that's called an attribute. So we're going to affirm particular attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as far as knowing Allah, right? We don't say Al-Alam Billah, we say Al-Arif Billah. Because the Arif is the one who can tell from the signs that is there, it exists even though he may not fully realize or comprehend what it is exactly. Hence, the dichotomy between Ma'rifah and Ilm. Right? And even beyond that, in, the, in Islamic epistemology, Ilm lahu darajat. Right? Ilm, usually if we say in an absolute sense, it means absolute knowledge. Like 100%, ironclad, unequivocal, no two ways about it. But sometimes, um, the ilm can be used to, uh, to express what's called غلبت الظن or to have a near certain knowledge right? but not an absolute certain knowledge and within our Islamic system we work with near certain knowledge and we work with absolutely certain knowledge and uh, we do not work with most of the time what's called shek which is doubt which is not being sure one way or the other very rare instances will check have any type of uh, 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 bearing on what we do. Some issues of fiqh only. When we talk about wudu and tahara, and wudu shek and there's khilaf in your ulama, there's it amongst the scholars about how much, you know, they have a, a general principle that says, yaqeen la yazudu bi shek. Certainty is not removed by doubt. Uh, the Maliki ulama understood this, but also they said that so if you have doubt about your wudu, all of the schools except the Maliki school will say uh, if you're certain that you had wudu initially and you're not certain that you lost it, then you remain in a state of wudu. However, the Malikiyah say that uh, if doubt enters into whether you had wudu or not, even though you are certain before, that is enough for you to be religiously precautious and to remove your wudu. Uh, so, they understood that as well. That's why I say shek, doubt. Um, it's, uh, it's generally matruk, it's not used. And then the lowest form, which is called wahem, delusion. Which means it's not based upon any indication whatsoever. One is just merely deluded into thinking uh, that this may have some bearing, or, uh, but in actuality, there's no bearing. Uh, a man who is uh, taking his uh, hedi, or his sacrificial animal to hajj, Right, and the, and the Prophet said, I saw him walking with it, not riding it. So we asked him, Why aren't you riding the, the animal? He said, Ya Rasulullah, na hadi, na tahadi, na hadi. This camel, female camel, is a, I'm going to sacrifice it at the Hajj. And the Prophet was like, Ride it. Why aren't you not riding it? In other words, he had a waham. Right? He had a wahm uh, or a delusion thinking, well, because it's going to be sacrificed, then maybe it's too sacred to ride upon on my way to Hajj. But there's no fiqh rule that says that. Right? That's just something you came up with that has no bearing whatsoever. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, no, ride the animal. When you get there, you sacrifice it. Call us in discussion. But on the way there, there's nothing to prevent you from riding it. So. We, we go by matters of absolute certainty, uh, specifically in matters of aqidah, of creed, and most of the time in fiqh, actually, it's going to be something less than absolute. It's going to be what's called ghalabat al right? Because here we're talking about mu'amalat, we're talking about um, things that are performed. So, for example, in tahara, one of the reasons that people get waswasa Right? or to have like an OCD type of uh, 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 issue with, with tahara is because they mix up absolute certainty with near certainty. Uh, in tahara, in wudu, and ghusl and so forth, you are not requested to have absolute certainty. What does that mean? It means when I wash my arm, for example, um, I do not have to ensure that every square nanomillimeter, nanometer, had water touch it. It's enough that according you know, to my best atiqat, because remember Ghazali said, Very, very important, crucial sentence he said there, statement. 
we are taken into account into that which we believe to be real or true, not that which is fi nafs al which means as it actually is. So that means if I do wudu, and according to my knowledge, what I perceive, I did my whole arm, khalas. Bari'at al I've done what I have to do. However, if it turns out, in Allah's knowledge, that I actually missed a spot, if I missed a spot, am I taken into account for that? Does Allah say, Is He going to take me into account? No, He's not. Why? As Imam Ghazali said, What we believe to be true. And this is true in most of Al Af'al. This is true in the deeds. Right? So I believe I did the wudu correctly. I don't have to go beyond that. I don't need to um, invest in an uh, electron microscope and put my arm underneath it every time I make wudu and then look in the microscope and make sure that you know every single cell of my skin has a H2O molecule attached to it. I don't have to do that. Right? That's not necessary. Why? Because it's burdensome. Right? Uh, right? This deen is meant to be easy or facilitated. Right? Look for tasdeed, look for taqrib. You know, do as best you can. Be, if you have to be approximate, that's fine. But um, no one will try to do it in what they think to be an unachievably perfect way, except Except the deen will defeat them. The deen will overcome them. So, and the laysa matlouban, that's not asked for. That's why people get into trouble sometimes, because they think, well, no, I have to do it perfect. In this sense, perfect is not required of you, nor is it achievable. So leave it. Just do according to, to the best of your ability. Um, so, in has its different categories, obviously, but when we talk about aqida, affirmation of reality, we're talking about absolute certainty. So when we talk about Allah, we're talking absolute certainty He exists and that He has these attributes. But as far as His understanding His essence or the true nature of His attributes, then we call that ma'rifa. Right? Al-Arif billah, ya'mal bi muqtada ilmihi. Right? He, he, he or she does according to what they know. And not necessarily that they know Allah exactly as He is. So truth then is affirmation of the existence or attribute of a thing as it is in reality. An interesting thing in the Islamic paradigm is truth kind of has two components to it. There is ma fi nafs al -am, in other words, how it exists in reality, and then the person who bears witness to that. What does that mean? If you would, for example, Surah Al-Munafiqun, um, the Munafiqun say that نَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ لَرَسُولَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ Take that, let's unpack that. The Munafiqun come to the Prophet and they say we bear witness that you are the Messenger of Allah. Is the Prophet not the Messenger of Allah? He is. It's a true statement. But then Allah says uh, Allah bears witness that you, indeed you are the Messenger of Allah, and He bears witness that the Munafiqun are kathibun, that they're liars. Yeah, but didn't they say a true statement? No. But they don't believe it. They don't believe the statement. So it's not a truth for them. So truth then has two aspects. Truth has how it actually is, and do you believe it or not? Because if you don't believe it, and you just say you believe it, it's not really a truth for you, even though it's a truth, what we say, in reality. So affirmation of is included in the, uh, uh, the articulation of a truth statement. Then the intellect becomes the means by which to perceive these truths. Those of you who study the Islamic sciences in Arabic, the same word is used for intellect and reason, which is aql. So you have to know when Aql is talking about the actual uh, entity of intellect, which is uh, an essential aspect of the human condition, or when it's talking about a source of knowledge or the way to reason something. That's another application of the word Aql. And 
they're not the same thing. Even though, see, I, I use two different words here, but the same word is used in, in the Arabic tradition at least. So intellect is the means by which you perceive these truths, and then reason becomes the method by which to discern these truths. <laughs> right? Sometimes referred to as al-aql al-mujarrad, or pure reason. And this is going to be built upon certain um, postulates like the, the, the law of non-contradiction non and things like that. You know, under, there are certain things that you don't have, don't have to be demonstrated to you. You know them self-evidently or intuitively. One plus one equals two. You don't really need to, to experience that or to be taught that. Or that the part is always smaller than the whole that it came from. Again, that self-evident knowledge. When the Quran talks about حَتَّى يَلَجَ الْجَمْلُ فِي سَمِّ الْخِيَاطِ Right? The Ufa will not enter paradise until the camel passes through the eye of the, the needle. Well, the camel is never going to pass through the eye of the needle. Why? Because it's inconceivable. And you don't have to try it to actually see that. So if the camel with its size, and the eye of the needle with its size, and nothing to be changed, it's impossible, inconceivable, for the camel to go inside that. Just like it's inconceivable for one plus one to equal anything but two. There is no universe where one plus one is going to equal to three. Right? It's the way that we understand the haqqat, the way that we understand the realities of this particular universe. So I'm going to kind of go over this quickly because we kind of went over a little bit intellect and knowledge. We talked about a little bit truth, and we mentioned the idea of degrees of truth. One thing that, um, the last point on that slide, as we mentioned about degrees of truth and based upon the certainty, and we talked about absolute certainty or, or near, near certainty, this hierarchy applies to knowledge based upon authoritative transmission and demonstrated repetition, not pure reason. Right? So something that I know self-evidently is going to be of the absolute certain category. And our belief in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based upon that category. The absolute certain category, not the near certain category. So it's not going to be based upon evidence, right, in the scientific sense as people talk about today. So when people say, well, I want to believe in God, but there's no evidence for it. What evidence are you looking for? Right? Are you, are you looking to go for the, what do you call it, the God particle or the higgins be so particle collider and somehow that's going to prove to you that God exists, right? They're looking for a type of evidence, an empirical evidence. What's empirical again? That which is perceptible to the senses, right? Which I can see, I can smell, I can touch, I can taste. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is imperceptible by the senses. So, the evidence, if there is any evidence, is not going to be in the form of empirical evidence. So when people ask for, show me the evidence that God exists, right, they're asking really for the impossible. Because you cannot point to something that is beyond perception and outside the total realm of sense perception by way of an evidence that's going to use sense perception. Right, so when you say, what evidence, there's no evidence. It's not that type of evidence. There's another type of evidence, right? Because we don't believe that the only way that you can know things is by perceiving them by your senses. We also believe there are other ways to know things. And you have an intellect, you have a heart. There are other means by which to know. Those are the means by which we know that Allah exists. So more about this reason then, since it's important and based upon it, we're going to reach to other conclusions. So it's the basis for discernment of reality from non-reality and truth from falsehood. These degrees of certainty do not apply. It's all absolutely certain. And there are two broad categories, what we call self-evident proof and demonstrated proof. So self-evident, here proof, we're not talking empirical proof. Imam al used the word to describe this type of proof. He called it al-burhan. <coughs> so burhan is an intellectual, rational proof. Proof by way of reason. 
not proof by way of empirical evidence. So the burhan will be of two types, right? That which is self-evident, al daruri right, which is necessarily known without demonstration, one nadari or demonstrated proof. And Muslims were not the only ones who refer to these two categories. If you read the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas of Aquinas, he also refers to these two types, demonstrated and self-evident. So, using all of that, the understanding of reason, the understanding of our intellect, the understanding that um, uh, the Sharia was transmitted to us by way of authoritative transmission, and it's also understood via our intellect, then we can piece together a kind of what I call here boundary and gateway for understanding the whole thing altogether. Right? And once we can piece that together and we can formulate it, then these spurious type of accusations and these spurious inferences that aren't really there are easily dismissed, right? Because you're not approaching it via its boundaries. We already described to you that within the tradition, we also know how to interpret the tradition, how to transmit it, how to know and distinguish that which is discerned by reason versus discerned by authoritative transmission versus discerned by empirical evidence. Certainly we have things that are of empirical evidence, right? Language is empirical. The, uh, the ulama, they realized the importance of the Arabic language and specifically the understanding of the Arabic language as it was during the time of the Nuzul, the time of the revelation. And they knew that was the key to understanding the Qur'an and also understanding the Sunnah. So they devoted much of their time and their energies to preserving the language of uh, of the Qur'an, specifically that classical 7th century Arabian uh, understanding of the Arabic language. And so they preserved all of the pre-Islamic poetry as well. Ibn al-Qais and uh, Nabila and the ones that we mentioned earlier. And they also uh, preserved uh, uh, you know, the, the I I idioms and the linguistic devices and rhetorical devices. All of these things were studied and they were documented in order to document the language of the Qur'an. But all of that is based upon empiricism, right? All of that is based upon actual physical evidence where the poets who use the word in this particular way. Ibn Abbas, for example, they would say, إِذَا أَشْكَلْ عَلَيْهِ شَيْءٍ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ If something from the Qur'an why it was ambiguous, what would he say? إِلْتَمِسُوهُ فِي دِوَانِ الْعَرَبِ Seek its meaning in the diwan, in other words, the poetry uh, literature, of the Arabs. And it's said that he would also dedicate a day of the week to studying and reading with his students the poetry of the Arabs. Right? So it became a means by which to understand the Qur'an. Well, one of the seven canonical reciters of the Qur'an, Abu Amr al he said that تَزَنْدَقَ أَكْثَرُ أَهْلِ الْعَوَاقِ لِجَهْلِهِمْ بِاللُّغَةِ That many of the people of Iraq, who were not from the Medina, who were not companions of the Prophet um, tazandaku. In other words, they adopted uh, spurious sects and understanding of Islam because of their ignorance of the Arabic language. So they read the Quran by themselves, they didn't have ulama, they didn't have shiuch, and then they read it and then they interpreted it in a way other than the way that it was meant. In other words, so they didn't have enough of the empirical because, again, going back to empiricism, enough of the empirical knowledge of the language in order to interpret it correctly. So empiricism definitely plays a role in how we understand the Islamic tradition. No one can say that it's not important or it doesn't have any validity as an epistemological method. No, it is a way of knowing. It's an important way of knowing, but all we're saying is it's not the only way of knowing. Right? It's not the whole game. It's not the whole show, but it's part of it. So if we were to kind of delineate boundaries of the tradition, in other words, the saying, this is what Islam is and this is what it's not. And that's a statement of itself, because some of the postmodern philosophies are telling you everything is self-defined. So Islam is what I think it is, or what I tell you it to be, and then that's okay. No, that's not okay. It is defined thing. Right? It does have parameters. It's nonsensical to, to suggest 
the idea that I will define it in the manner I wish to define it. That's like saying, well, you know, I, I like democracy, I'm a Democrat, but I'm going to define it in the way I define it, and I think that uh, no elections and uh, no elected members and uh, no civil rights and no rule of law, and whatever I say goes, that's democracy to me. People would laugh at me. But that's exactly what people are saying. People are putting nonsensical statements as a preface in their book saying, Islam is on thin ice with me, and, and other stuff like that, and making statements that uh, there are surahs in the Qur'an that were put there after the Prophet Wasallam. This is what people are saying. I was at a conference last weekend that's a very prominent conference in the United States, and that's what some people were saying, even Muslims. This is where the state of the, this is where it's at. This is what's being put out there in many of the religious studies departments of U.S. universities. And so, <clears throat> you know, if your child or your daughter or your brother or sister are taking Islam 101 class, and you think they're learning about Islam, they may not be learning about Islam. They're learning about the deconstruction of Islam. So, you know, we need to to be properly. Uh, uh, equipped and informed and, and, and well aware of our tradition beyond just memorizing the ritual aspects of it. We need to know, you know how to be grounded and rooted in it to the degree we can counter these uh, fallacious arguments and, and uh, philosophies and, and methods. So, understanding the text of the Qur'an and the Hadith is one of the main boundaries Right? So, Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi everybody has agreed that this is the root, this is the way by which you understand what Islam is. But, everybody says that. Right? As, uh, as they always say, uh, Right? Everybody claims that uh, they've seen Layla, they've been with Layla, but Layla says, I don't know this guy. Right, so everyone says Quran Sunnah, Quran Sunnah, Quran Sunnah. Everybody's claiming that, but there is a method by which to go about understanding the Quran and Sunnah. So one is, as I just mentioned, the parameters of the classic Arabic language. So any sort of postmodernist notion that the original intent of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala behind the meanings of the Quran is irrelevant, right away, that should raise red flags. Immediately. No. We understand it in the language it was revealed. Yes, there is a sort of sort of dichotomy, almost paradox, in that the Quran is the eternal speech of Allah, which is an uncreated attribute. But yet the Quran, with its language, with its words, with its letters, with its sounds, definitely is created in that aspect. And this was an early polemical discussion slash discourse that happened uh, around the time of Ahmed al Hanbal and a little bit after him, Imam al-Ash'ari. These, the, these were kind of the main theological um, conundrums of the time. How do we reconcile al-Qadim al-Hadith? How do we reconcile what seems to be a revealed book, but it's the uncreated word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, one of the resolutions that the ulama of, uh, of Kalam reached was that, well, there's two types of love. There's two types of words that we infer from the Qur'an, or two types of kalam. So there's kalam in lavi wa kalam in nafsi. And kalam in nafsi is the uncreated attribute of Allah, the eternal speech of Allah, which is not defined nor delimited by language, or by letter, or by sound, because those are created things. But there's no way of expressing that except via the created medium of language. Right? Then that would be Kalam Allah in Lavi by the words. So the words themselves, in terms of the letters and the sounds, indicate, point to, the uncreated word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, namely the meanings. So you cannot get to the meanings or Kalam in Nafsi except by way of Kalam and Lavi, the words themselves. So the words then, as indicators, take on that significance. So then that means there is a divine intent and a connection between the symbols that we call letters and words and the actual meanings, right? And Sayyidina Ali, for example, referred to kind of this multi-varied uh, varied aspect of understanding the Qur'an. He said that every letter or every word in the Qur'an 
has a zahir and a batin. A zahir and a batin. And I can't remember the third one. So it says an inward and an outward. And it also has something, the third one, and a muntaliq. So it has an inward and an outward, and perhaps the third one was its uh, purported meaning or manifested meaning, and then a muntalik, where you can go from there. So there are inner, outward meanings, there are inward meanings, there are meanings that can be inferred, and in the Islamic paradigm, one of the conditions that these meanings have to be complementary, not contradictory. Complementary, not contradictory. And modern discourse has a real problem with that. Right, the idea that there can be multiple meanings and they're all a reflection of the author's intent is problematic. How so? Well, in the Quran, for example, there's a verse that says about the Quran itself, لا يمسوه إلا المطهرون. Right? لا يمسوه إلا المطهرون. No one in mess means to touch in the physical sense. So no one will touch it except المطهر. So if we're talking physically, that means the fuqaha inferred from this those who are in a physical, ritual state of purity. Yani al wudu. And there's an ijma of the ulama, the four schools of law, madahib, uh, that someone must be in a state of wudu in order to touch the pages of the mushaf. With certain exceptions here and there. Is that the only meaning? No. Others said there's also an inward meaning. A spiritual meaning, if you will. In other words, those who are except in a state of spiritual purity, will they penetrate the meanings of the Quran? So when mas'una bi ma'na, to penetrate the meanings, ma'na al-fahm, when idraq, to understand, to realize the meanings of the Quran, that's another meaning. Those two meanings are not contradictory. You can have both at the same time. It can mean both things. So this sort of multivocal way that the Qur'an can, can, can furnish its meanings, right, is something quite unique about it as well. And even on an individual basis, when you read the Qur'an, you go back to it once and twice and three times, there may be things that come out for you that didn't come out the time before or the time before that. There may be things that are revealed via the meanings of the Qur'an in our day that were not revealed to our predecessors. That's also quite possible, right? And they have a famous sewing, uh, saying that says, uh, You may find in the river that which you don't find in the sea. And there was actually a very famous professor, his name was uh, Abu Hayyan al-Andarusi, and he had two major works of tafsir. One of them was called uh, Al-Bahr al-Muhit, and the other one was called Al-Nahr al-Madid, I believe Al-Nahr al-Madid, yeah. Um, so with Bahr al-Muhid, the all-encompassing ocean or sea, and it's a much bigger book. We studied it, and it was, you know, to get through what page of that is going to take you ten readings, maybe. Very elaborate, talks about all of the Qira'at, and the Nahu, and the Saf, and, you know, al Aujuh. Yani, a, a, a very sort of a technical, advanced, and I would say difficult tafsir. Then he had another one called Al-Nahr al-Madid, the river, or the, the river that... Uh, it, it, it kind of keeps on giving, extends. And much shorter and much easier to understand. But they said, he wrote, the Nahr al Madid came later. He said, they said, there are things in there you don't find in the Bahr al Muhit. There are insights he came to, even though it was shorter and easier to comprehend, right, and probably ostensibly written as an abridgment of the larger one. But he had new things that were in the Nahr al Madid that were not in the Bahr al Muhit. So, um, the language is, is, is paramount here. And, you know, one of the dangers is in, in, in the Arab world, unfortunately, now that um, this language is being lost, it's deteriorating. Right? And I don't mean that people not learning the rules of grammar and, and things like that, but the conceptual frameworks behind the meanings of the language, they're being replaced by foreign ones. You pick up any uh, 
Arabic newspaper today and you read it, it's like you're reading a Western language newspaper, except it's translated. Right? It's just like, it's basically just rehashing something they picked up from a, a foreign language and kind of rehashing and putting it in, in a word, in, in language, even using idioms that are foreign to the Arabic language. Right? And these things are being introduced and they exist in English language, but they sound funny when you bring them over and, and translate them. Right? One of the, the ones that they use all the time and they talk about in politics, they'll say, لَعَبَ أَمْرِكَ دَوْرًا فِي كَذَا وَكَذَا وَكَذَا You know, which has no meaning technically in Arabic. Because from English it's translated, you know, this country or America played a role in blah blah blah. But we don't use, we don't say play a role, like, we don't use that wording in, in the classical Arabic construct. You know, لَعِبَتْ Because لَعِبَتْ means to play, literally. It doesn't have the metaphoric meaning of to assume a particular role, right? So you wouldn't say لعب الدوران, right? You would say مثلا تمثل الدوران or something like that, but not لعب الدوران وهكذا. So you find this uh, a lot, and, and many of the young people today, I taught a group of um, Arab students a couple of years back, and many of them, they couldn't even write Arabic. In fact, Probably the, the millennial generation or younger, they, they write Latin letters, but substitute numbers and things for like a ain or, or letters that don't uh, exist in the, uh, in the Arabic language, uh, in the English language. So they would write their text messages and things like that, not in English, but in Arabic, but transliterated with Latin letters. And they don't really have an appreciation for how to write the Arabic language. And many of them could not discriminate between you know, seen and saw, and ta and ta and ta and ta and so forth. The, you know, the muraqqaq letters versus the mufaqqam because it all sounds like, you know, just a a, a va sound or a s sound, and they don't know how to, to uh, uh, to, to 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 discern between the two of them. It's a big problem. Um, you know, other countries, uh, the French, speak and think in French. The Germans speak and think in German. The Japanese think and speak in Japanese, but yet the Arabs think and speak in English and then translate it to Arabic. Um, it's basically kind of the, the, the scenario that we're seeing. And so it needs a revival, right? Uh, many of these books that are used in the, um, the education ministries in, in, in Arab countries, they are unchanged from the 1950s. But yet you look at the foreign language instruction books, like in English, and you know the pedagogical method has been updated, and they have these very uh, you know bright pictures and and, uh, and tables and things. And so when the student looks at the Arabic language one, and he's like, that's like from 1952, and it's still talking about Malik Farouk. And this one is from you know has like an iPad that comes with it and CD you know DVDs, and it's all been updated. What is the impression that's left? And even on top of that. In you know what's called the national GPA, the national average, oftentimes Arabic language is not included in that. It's like an ancillary subject that doesn't count as much as physics or chemistry or history for that matter. So this de-emphasis, this marginalization of the language, then uh, is leaving an impression with many young, young Arab Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Like Arabic language is not important, and that. Uh, it's not Arabic, that the language, the lingua franca of the age we're in, certainly not Arabic, and it's just a drag, and why do you have to learn, learn it? And the prestige and status is assigned to languages that are Latin languages. For a while it used to be French, maybe two, three decades ago, but it's not even French anymore, definitely English. So anyone who you know, can speak English like an American or like a Brit, and can do it fluently, then you're like gold in, in a lot of these countries. But to have a fluent Arabic tongue, not really a big deal. Who cares? What, what are you going to use that in? It's not something that uh, has any sort of practical application. Number two, scholarly consensus. This is something that's also been assailed and attacked. Um, so we said by virtue of the language, it's multivocal. You can speak in many voices. 
and there are different interpretations that may be complementary. But that, does that mean that I can make it mean anything I want it to mean? No. Because it's bound by this concept called consensus. So the, the nusus themselves are circumscribed, right? The, in other words, boundaries made about them by this issue of consensus. What is consensus? Is it some sort of antiquated patriarchy where a bunch of males, Muslim male scholars, got together in a room, like in Vatican Council II or in the Council of Nicaea or something like that, and they all took votes, and they said, okay, what do you all think of, uh, you all think we need wudu to do the prayer? Yes, all in favor say yay, and everybody raises their hand, and then so it's decided that you have to have wudu to pray. No, it didn't work like that, it's not the way it happened. What happened is, is that consensus is reached by uh, uh, a consensus of individual mushtahidun, right? Individual people who have the requisite uh, intellectual tools by which to make istinbat, to interpret the Qur'an and Sunnah. And each one of them, in their own, let's think of it as independent laboratory, arrive at the same result. So it's really kind of an, an, an empirically based uh, tool. So it's the same as, for example, if we all said, we all want to figure out the, um, the boiling point of water. Let's see, this is before centigrade and Fahrenheit, and, you know, or pre-Fahrenheit, pre pre-scales you know, and so forth. And we want to figure out when does water boil. So each one of us retreats to their independent laboratory. Right, and so I go in my laboratory, and I, you know, I uh, I measure the temperature by which it boils, and I get 211 or something like that. And then Yusuf goes in his laboratory, and he gets like 212.2, and you know, for then, and other people go in their laboratories, and they're all basically within 212 a degree or so of that. And then we say, you know what? It seems like there's a consensus here that water is going to boil around 212 degrees. So in different conditions, it's going to be 212 Fahrenheit. And it's not going to be anything different than that. Then we reach a consensus. But then some guy come, walks, walks into the masjid, or let's say into our laboratory. It's not a masjid, make it the laboratory. And after all these hundreds, if not thousands, of independent scientists all measured the boiling point of water to be 212, he comes and said, you know what, you guys are all wrong. You've been doing it all wrong for decades. The boiling point of water is actually 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what I think. Well, do you have any proof for that? No, no, this is my opinion. I know, I'm pretty sure about it. And I think that's what it is. Are you a scientist? No, I work, I sell Pete's coffee, but I, you know, I've worked with the coffee machines and I'm feeling like if we get it to 70 degrees, the coffee will still kind of combine with the water in a good way. So I'm thinking, you know, that works too as a boiling point. We would like laugh him out of the laboratory and say, well, this guy is a, is, a, is a hack, right? He's a quack and a hack, and he's always talking about, get him out of here. But yet, this is what is happening now. People are openly challenging consensus issues in the deed and say, well, I think it's going to be this way because I think that's what I think. And that's the way it is. So the consensus of all that means each one of them, by their... Uh, juristic methodologies, which are not always uniform, there are differences. Malik had a set of juristic tools a little bit different than Abu Hanifa, than Imam al-Shafi, than Abu Hamad al than Abu Zai, than Sufyan al and Sufyan al-Thawri, than al tabari you know, all these people were in that category. Then Sittina Aisha, she was also Mushtahid Imam, Imama. They all had their particular methodological tools, but somehow, despite that, they reach the same conclusion. They're looking at the same Muslims, or slightly different, maybe some had a hadith that they don't have, but nevertheless, they reach the same conclusion about this issue. That's how the consensus works. And there are not that many issues like that. Some of the Ramat tried to write a book about it, and they numbered maybe a hundred, right, in terms of what we call uh, uh, ijma al jali you know, clear consensus. There's another type of ijma called ijma sukuti which means that no one, no one dissented, so it's assumed that there was a consensus on the issue. But whatever the case may be, you know, it wasn't about people taking votes and 
you know, old men in robes figuring out what the deen is so that they can subjugate, right, and maintain their system of power and authority over the hapless laity. That's the narrative, that little story there is what they teach in academia sometimes. This is what they put out in their dissertations and their books, that the automat wanted to keep a monopoly over the people and they were often colluders with the sultans and the tyrants in a way so that they can keep the people under their thumb and they can maintain their system of authority and they didn't want anyone going interpreting the Quran for themselves because that would remove their authority. Well, that narrative actually happened, but not in the Muslim world, that happened in Europe, that happened with the Protestant Reformation, that happened with modern Luther, that happened with the papal indulgences and the church. So all of that history, that understanding has been then superimposed upon Islam and says, well, this is your history too. And we're like, wait a minute, that's not our history. That's your history. That's how it turned out for you. We weren't selling people places in heaven for money. You did that. Catholic Church did that. We never did that. Right? We didn't have that type of clerical body at the top that would say what the doctrine is. That's how the church operates. The church operates what the Pope says is the deen is the deen. No questions asked. There's not this idea of istinbab and interpreting the, the Bible or the Old and New Testament to arrive at a, you know, at a conclusion. This is what Martin Luther was protesting. This is what started the Protestant Reformation. This is how we got all of the Protestant denominations and uh, after that the evangelical denominations. We don't have that history like that. Maybe some similarities along the way here and there, but certainly didn't turn out in that same particular way. So for us, it's not about this um, uh, artificial clerical class at the top. We're all colluding together. I would describe it as I just described it now, more like independent scientists, each working in their own laboratory, and then they arrive at the same conclusion. To me, that would be a more accurate metaphorical description of what's going on. So when someone comes and claims to have something completely new and unprecedented that nobody else figured out before, well, you're dissenting with something that's a consensual issue. We already figured this part out. We already, we already know that marriage is between man and woman. There's not going to be marriage between man and man or woman and woman. It's an issue of consensus. No one dissented. There's nothing you can bring. There's no type of evidence you can cite. There's no argument that you can make that will make that legitimate. By Islam? Absolutely not. We have to be clear about that. They can say and talk all they want. But there is no, there's no dissent. It's an issue of consensus. There is no relationship outside of marriage, number one, to begin with. And that relationship has to be within a marriage. And it's going to be between a male and a female. Who are otherwise not related and they can marry one another. That's it. And then there are certain conditions that go along with that. There has to be a dowry and witnesses and Siva and you know they have to agree and all that type of thing. This is consensual issue. Right from the fifth, from the jurisprudence, everyone was working in their own independent laboratory. This is the conclusion that they reached. There are five prayers in the day and they have different numbers of rakas. No one is going to be removed from the burden of having to pray. That doesn't happen either. Right? There were some Muslims who made such claims. They said, you know, uh, Imam Junaid was asked about people who said Qadwasalu. You know, they've, they've arrived right, at a spiritual plane where they don't have to pray anymore. He said, now, Masru ila saqr. He says, yes, they've arrived, but they arrived to hell. No one is going to be free from the, from the confines of the Sharia. Everyone is bound by the Sharia. Whether you are wali awliya or whether you are yani, ashqal ashqiya, you're still going to have to be confined by the confines of the Sharia. These are consensual issues. So, um, you know, this is a boundary of the deen. I was once asked in the aftermath of uh, the Orlando uh, massacre that happened in that, that gay club. Um, and I said, you know, uh, we understand that people may have inclinations for same-sex affinities and things like this. And that's been around since time immemorial. And we know that people have those inclinations. But for us, the issue is not the inclination. The issue is acting upon it. Just like people might have inclination even for the same sex, but or, or the opposite sex, but has to be within a marriage. So, you know, we don't take people to task for their own inclinations. This may be a test, tribulation, so forth. That's what I said. And he, the reporter said to me, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, but um, when are you guys going to accept uh, homosexuality, make it legitimate within your religion?" 
<laughs> I said, never. He's like, what? No, you didn't hurt me. Never. It's never going to happen. I don't have the authority to do that. Right? As, a, as someone who's a student of, of the dean, I don't have the authority to do that. And I know that no one is going to reach that conclusion. Because it's an issue of consensus. You guys want to talk about tolerance, you want to talk about having an appreciation of other opinions, I see that you're very intolerant. Because this is something that's part and parcel of the way that we look at life. We don't um, uh, force anyone, we don't put it upon anyone, we don't enforce it upon anyone. If they choose to do otherwise, it's up to them. But you cannot enforce upon us a particular way, right, when this is something we have no doubt about it. So he, he read, he led the article, I said a million things about that incident, but he puts at the top of the page, obviously, um, Muslims may be sympathetic but don't accept homosexuals or something like that. Or they don't, not quite ready to accept them yet. Or something of that sort. So, but I think, you know, we have to be confident, we have to stand our ground uh, in the face of this massive assault, not just from, from that type of issue, but many, many things. And we have to know what the deen is, and that it's definable. One of the things that makes it definable is this issue of uh, consensus, right? Um, modesty and covering, both for men and women, these are issues of consensus, and there are minimum amounts. And the hijab, as is described today, is a fault. It's an obligation. There's no way around it. It's not something that it may be, maybe not, maybe people interpret the Quran long, maybe it's the male patriarchy. Everybody reaches the same conclusion. Whether a woman chooses to apply it or not, that's her choice, and we don't force it upon her. But if you're asking what the deen says, right, what the religious stipulation of the deen is, it's unequivocal. It's a matter of consensus, right? And it should be enough for the informed Muslim, when I say it's a matter of consensus, that they don't ask me for delil after that. Well, what's the delil? It's not mentioned in the Quran. Actually, no, it is mentioned in the Quran, right? It's mentioned in Surah An-Nur. You're looking for something in your head that's very specific, right? And our understanding of it doesn't have to be in the specific language that you're looking for. The Quran, for example, doesn't say la tazinu. It doesn't say don't commit fornication. It says wala taqrabu zina. Right? Don't approach it. So someone who's playing games can say, oh, it says don't approach it. So it doesn't mean don't do it, right? So I'll just do it and not approach it. In other words, I'll, you know, I won't do the muqaddimat, I'll just do the actual act. Right? This is playing around with the language. Because in the Arabic language, as we said earlier, go back to understanding the text of the Quran prophetic hadith, there is a, a, a rhetorical device called fahw al-khitab. What's fahw al-khitab? It means that there are two components to any text. Something called al-mantuq wal mafhum Mantuq means that which is articulated in explicit letters. Then there's something and mantuq is that which could be understood. So when it says la taqrabu zina, it means don't approach zina, don't do the muqaddimat, right? Don't do the things that might lead to it. And min bab awla, right? What does it mean min bab awla? And by virtue of, if you're not allowed to do the things that lead up to it, then certainly the thing itself is even going to be more haram. So this khitab, then this, this command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's prohibiting the things that lead up to it, and certainly as well, the actual thing itself. When the Quran says in terms of treatment of parents, Don't say off to them, and don't revile them in speech. Does that mean I can push them down the stairs? Because it didn't, it didn't say that specifically. If low can if the lowest thing is to say off, right? And Arabs today they still say off. Off means like, yeah, I need later for you, as we would say in uh, in English. Like uh, I want you to go take out the garbage and do this and change all the coffee. Off, like yeah, leave me alone. That is prohibited to say to the parent, right? To let them see that from you. So that means anything above and beyond that is going to be prohibited as well. This is what we call fahw al khitab. And if you didn't study juristic methodology, if you didn't study usul al fiqh, you wouldn't know that. Right? How did we get this particular concept? Go back to the mujtahidun in the laboratory, because that's what they all said, that's what they agreed upon. They all came to the same conclusion that the language means this, the intent behind it is this. 
and it's based upon consensus. All of them reach the same conclusion. You want to come up with a whole different deen and a whole different set of tools and a whole different way of doing it? Ahlan wa sahlan. Be my guest. Just don't call it Islam. Call it something else. Call it what you want to call it. Right? Call it new wave, I don't know what. But don't call it Islam. Certainly not Islam. Third, so we've described two of the boundaries. We said the Arabic language, understood the Quran and the Quran Hadith, the scholarly consensus. The scholarly consensus then also leads to um, extrapolating based upon a holistic reading of Lunusus, namely the Quran and Sunnah, that there are certain overarching themes that the laws or the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are seeking to um, to imbibe within us, to preserve within us, to say this is significant, this is important, this is why this is happening. This is what is referred to by some as maqasid al-shari'a. And generally they say that the maqsad of the sharia, that the main goal of the sharia, jalb uh, al-masalih wa dar al-mafasid, is to anything which is in the interest of humanity, right, for that to be permitted to us and even encouraged, and anything that is not in the interest of humanity, that will harm humanity, to be removed and to be avoided. This is based upon the Muhammadan Sharia, the Sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu which is all na'am wa khaliya min al niqam It is all blessings and all that is good, and there's nothing in it that's arbitrary as a punishment. This happened with previous Ummah. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, uh, يُحِلُّ لَكُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ so everything that is tayyib, in other words, it's good in and of itself, is going to be halal. And anything that is khabith, which is harmful in and of itself, is going to be haram. That's a blessing. That's a huge thing. Because previous ulam, Bani Israel didn't have it like that. Right? فَبِالظُلِّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ هَادُوا حَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ طَيِّبَاتٍ وَحِلَّتْ لَهُمْ So by the wrongdoing, مِنَ الَّذِينَ هَادُوا that came before you. حَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ طَيِّبَاتِ Here it is, تَحْرِيمِ الطَّيِّبَاتِ So things that were طَيِّب, that were good in of themselves, were made haram. Why? By their ظُلْم, right? By their corruption, by their wrongdoing. This is a punishment, it's a nikma for them. That's why it's like that. But we don't have anything like that in our Sharia. There's nothing that is a nikma. It's all ni'am and blessing. So every single thing that's a command that we're ordered to do, there is a tayyib thing in it. There's a wisdom behind it. There's something that's going to be in our own interest even in this life, let alone the, the spiritual life and the life of the next world. And also those things that are haram, that are forbidden from us, it's for our own good. And it's to avoid something that is harmful. So they discern that this is what the sharia is all about. Beyond that, they discern five kind of major categories of how these things could be understood. And they put it in a hierarchy. So the highest is the preservation of the integrity of Islam. In other words, what we know Islam to be. Its morals, its ethics, its values, its principles. In other words, to understand how to go about doing our life in a way that Allah has commanded us to do it. Preserving that is quite important. This is what we call the deen. Because if we lose that, we may have physical life, but what type of life is going to be. It's like a life that's no life. So this is at the highest level, the highest category. One right below that is the preservation of life. Life is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has bequeathed us life and existence. And so it's not to be taken lightly, it's not to be forfeited lightly, it's not to be sacrificed lightly. Intellect, that which makes us human, that which allows us to discern truth from falsehood. That which allows us to discern right from wrong. So if we don't have that, what type of life we're going to have? Wealth or property or the ability of people to have things that are considered to be affiliated with them. This is part of the social structure, the communal structure of humanity. There's also a preservation for that. So all of the ahkam, the economic commercial transaction law that you find in Islam, it's geared so that there will be no social or civil strife that comes out of 
transactions. Why? Because they said that al مبني على المشاحة. Right? اقتصاد مبني على المشاحة. That buying and selling commercial transactions it is necessarily going to be contentious. That's just the nature of it. Why is it going to be contentious? Because I have something to sell and you have money to buy it with. But my interest is to sell for as high a price as I can get. And your interest is to buy for as low as price you can get. Those two interests uh, are not reconcilable. Can't have both. So what's going to happen? A negotiation. Right? So this negotiation, it can be contentious or it can be civil. Right? And if there's anything within that negotiation where one of us feels that we have been tricked or duped or usurped or not given the whole truth, then it's not going to be just the commercial transaction is going to be in effect here. We're talking about society too, right? We're talking about, you know, Yusuf sold me a lemon car, that Toyota Prius he told me about, that ran great and gets 100 miles per gallon. That thing is a lemon and it doesn't even go into third gear and now I'm getting 20 miles per gallon. And, you know, the electric part doesn't work and I keep out to filling unleaded premium gasoline in it. And he didn't tell me that. So now, right, I'm not just upset about the car, I'm a little upset at Yusuf, too. Not that Yusuf would do something like that, just sitting right in front of me as an example. And so as a result, you know, I'm, I'm mad, I'm angry, and maybe I'm not going to stop at Yusuf. Maybe I'm going to look at his family, maybe I'm going to look at his neighborhood, right? Other things. Because people are varying degrees of commitment to upholding human decency. So, part of the Sharia then is to, to avoid all of that. To avoid all of that. So, it seeks to eliminate those issues that will be contentious, right? And one of those contentious issues, for example, they mentioned is al gharam or uncertainty in the transaction. So, the transaction, first and foremost, should be made upon the assumption of certainty. In other words, I know what I'm getting. I know the car that I'm getting. I know Mu'asafat uh, and, and, and all of the things in it. And he knows exactly what he's getting in terms of how much I'm going to pay. And that there should be no fooling around with that. That's why they said you don't sell something you don't possess. So if I'm a fisherman, and I haven't gone fishing today yet, but I want to sell Yusuf, uh, you know, two, uh, two tons of uh, tuna that I haven't quite yet fished out of the Pacific Ocean, Right? And I promise to deliver, and he pays me $2,000. And then Wednesday comes around, I'm supposed to deliver, and I tell you, so well, I don't have it. Well, now what? I have his money, but I spent it. Now what happens to you? So what do you call that? Is it now become a loan? And if it's a loan, then uh, what about the cost, opportunity cost for Yusuf, who could have bought something else with that, and could have bought from another merchant? with that money, but it all started because it was, it was, it was predicated on uncertainty, right? There was some element of uh, an unacceptable element of uncertainty in the transaction that allowed that to happen. So, um, you know, the preservation of these, you know, muqassasat, everyone has a thing that they are affiliated with them and that they, they can see it as their own property and to dispense with as they please in a manner, right, that conforms to uh, the, 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 the confines and the precincts of the Sharia so that everyone gets their hat, gets their right. That's an important concept. And they discern that from a holistic reading of, of the Sharia, of the Nusus. And then finally, family and communal structures. Sometimes this is uh, put before wealth, sometimes after. Uh, sometimes something called uh, uh, honor is also, is also put there, which is, and they're all kind of related so honor, family, communal structures, in a sense, this idea of hibdin and sab, right? That people should know where they fit into the community, right? Which means they need to know who their mother and their father are. They need to know where they fit into the greater community and social structure. And so if that is not preserved, then people won't know who they are, right? People have this loss in the sense of their identity. And everyone has a natural inclination to want to know where they came from. They want to know who their parents are. They want to know who their grandparents are. They want to know where their extended family is. Um, and they want to feel secure in that. And so many of the, the family law uh, issues that come up in Islam, in terms of, uh, of marriage, and also in terms of divorce, in terms of bilah and hadana and uh, you know, uh, 
custody and, and alimony and all those things that are discussed in Islamic Hamid al that are all sought there to preserve this sort of communal structure. And associated with that is preserving the honor of people. So the had punishment that is associated with honor is to accuse someone falsely of adultery or to accuse someone of being a product of adultery. That's a had punishment. In other words, there's a mandatory punishment that the judge must dispense if someone does that. Because it's not just you know knowing someone's uh, knowing where you come from, but also to have that protected in the sense that no one should be able to assail that right by way of speech or slander is also an important concept. Right? Because you can assail someone, right, even though it may not be true, but once that spreads and it gets out there, that also will cause strife within the community and within the social structure. So that's also an imperative within the Sharia. So all of the, the, the issues that deal with Ghiba and Namima and slander and calumny and all those things also uh, are important in that aspect. So number four, the Islamic paradigm or worldview, which we're saying is how do we see the world, how do we see reality? This is informed by our belief system or our theta, answers such questions as why am I here, where did I come from, where am I going, why am I significant, right? If you think about it, we have answers to all of those questions. Or, you know, we have means by which to find out the answer, at least in a general sense. In an individual sense, you know, that's something that, you, inshallah, will guide you, what's my specific role in all of this, but at least we have the sense of grounding. Right, that, that, that steers us in our life and how we go about living our life. So that makes then a link between embodying this paradigm. In other words, I'm here for a purpose. There's a reason I'm here. I'm not here by mistake. Uh, I'm not just meant to be here to exist and eat and drink and be merry and then that's all there is to life and just fulfill my physical desires. But there's a greater purpose behind that. So then there's a link between this and having a moral code, right, to, to, to live your life deliberately and understand that your actions will have effects upon others uh, and that you can bring happiness into other people's lives or you can bring misery. You have the power to do that. And so um, you have to choose which one you're going to try to do. All of that goes into the understanding of why am I here and what am I supposed to be doing here versus someone who has no such grounding, who has no sense of the reality of the world this way, then invariably they're going to fall on the lowest common denominator of their existence, which is, let me just fulfill my physical desires. Right? So all of these scandals we're hearing as of late, in this state of yours, California, with Hollywood and Harvey Weinstein and all of the stuff that's happening, it's, why are we surprised? You know, why, why did we think that people who don't have a particular moral code that they live by would be anything but that? Right? When they're in a position where it seemed that there were going to be no repercussions at the time, they were in a position of power, influence, authority over the victims, then what's to stop them? Nothing, except if you have an internal moral code. That's what would stop you. So once that's removed, then why are we surprised? Right? If you don't have a moral code that you're living by, it's not about the repercussions that may happen, necessarily that's going to stop you, because they may or may not happen, but there's something of a more powerful force that will keep you in check and will tell you that I have a bigger job to do here than just fulfill my physical wants and desires. So also, number five or six of them, we'll finish them before the break, the general principles of the prophetic teachings or the Sharia. Also, this is based upon a holistic reading and this is a little bit more specific than the five maqasid that we mentioned earlier. So there are these things like no harm or reciprocating harm, la dhamar wa la dirar, right? So anything that we implement from the Sharia should be predicated on that understanding as a general consensual issue. La tazgu wa azmatu mizr ukhra, no one bears the burden of someone else, no one's going to be taken into account for someone else's mistake. That's a core principle. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, certainty is not removed by doubt. So these are all types of core principles that inform our approach and our moral behavior, not just in fiqh, but in general, in the etiquettes and adabs and our interpersonal relationships uh, and so forth. Someone harms me in an emotional way, I'm not justified in harming them back just to get back at them. 
let me go by the overriding principle, la dara wa la dira, because the Prophet said it like that. He didn't qualify it. So in reaction to harm, you are not justified in reciprocating that harm. You are to remove the harm if you can, right? Or you're to alleviate it. But to reciprocate it just as a matter of revenge, right? Because Aisha said about the Prophet he would not seek revenge or retribution on his own behalf or his own personal slights. He's only talking about when something of the, the, the commands of the Sharia are violated, that's a different story. But la yantasar nafsi And then finally, understanding of the context, what's sometimes referred to as tasawwur uh, uh, or fahm al waqi'ah, right? So we have this set of principles, we have this set of values, but then we have real life on the ground situations. And so whenever you have a practical application, then you have this um, huge body of theory and, and, max, and axioms and laws, well then there's going to be a space between those two of when do you apply and how do you apply? And is this situation what I think it is? so that I can apply it. Or it's not the situation that I think it is. And I believe Muslims are getting into a lot of trouble in this particular area. Right? So we, we have to take into the particular context of the situation. You know, it's as simple as some you know, well-meaning and well-intentioned brothers can come walking into MCC right now and they have their shoes on and they walk into the musallah with their shoes right, and dragging dirt and, and so forth and then um, Brother Asif goes out to them and says, uh, Brothers, um, why are you wearing your shoes on the carpet in the masjid? He said, Akhi, you don't know the sunnah of the Prophet He used to walk with his na'alain. He used to walk with his sandals in the masjid. We're doing the sunnah. What's the problem? The problem, Akhi, is uh, they didn't have a carpet. That the inside of the masjid was the same as the outside. They had sand inside, just as they did outside. They didn't even have any type of floor covering. And so in their particular context, right, there was no difference from them wearing their sandals or not wearing their sandals. But now, we have an overarching principle, right? لا تضر ولا ديران, no harm or reciprocating harm. And we like nadafa and nadafa from an iman, cleanliness is from iman. And so keeping our masjid clean, right, especially from people tracking dirt on their shoes from the outside, and they could have walked possibly on a type of nijasa, and then you bring it in here, you're the one who's not practicing the sunnah at this point. You're contravening it because you took something out of context. You didn't apply it properly. The principle is right, follow the sunnah, correct? Imperative. But you didn't follow it right because you didn't understand the context of it. Um, so what, understanding the context, understanding the wata, understanding the circumstances in our situation is extremely important. Otherwise, on what basis are you going to make an evaluation and say this ruling applies here? Or this principle has an application here? You have to understand what's going on. You have to be able to see what's going on. Otherwise, if you don't know, how could you possibly make a proper evaluation? So this includes uh, context regarding applicability of rulings in the past to contemporary circumstances, just as, as I just mentioned. Imam al-Qalafi very famously he said, you cannot take the fatawa of a previous uh, uh, generation of scholars and apply them somewhere else, just like that. Because fatwa means specific situation. A fatwa is a response to a specific practical situation. Someone, there's a mustafti, they asked a question, they said, my situation, one, two, three, four, five. And then the mufti answered them. So you can't just take it like that and say, well, I think the situation is the same. Unless you're, you're, you're qualified and you have the credentials to make that determination, you can't just put it there. It doesn't work like that. Imam Malik very famously uh, recounted in the Tartib al-Madarik of the Qadi Ayyad, he said a group came from Al-Andalus, uh, from Islamic Spain, and they came to Malik and they asked him 48 questions. And he said to 36 of them, I don't know. And they said, what should we tell the people? We tell them Malik doesn't know. And they left. And most people stop there at that story, but there's a second part to that story. Uh, the non medikis to be fair, stop at that point. The medikis know that there's a second half to the story. <laughs> so, um, his 
students around him said, uh, Ya Imam, we've heard you answer these questions before, with us. We know the answer to them, because you've told us, you've had answers to these questions, so why did you not answer them? He said, they're going to Spain, they're going to Al-Andalus, right? And if I have a change in my ishtihad about this particular mas'ala, you guys are here with me, I can just tell you. But they're leaving and I may never see them again. So why am I going to do something that I'm not certain about and give it to them and they're going to go apply it there and I have no way of changing it afterwards. I have no way of reaching them. This is called wara. This is being scrupulous. Because even if he did give him his mushtahad opinion at the time, it would still be valid even if he changes mind later on. Imam al-Shafi very famously has in Madhab al-Qadim and Madhab al-Jadid. And they're both valid in the sense that even though he may have um, reoriented some of his opinions and went a different direction, it doesn't mean that the older opinion is invalid. But nevertheless, Imam Malik was very cautious. So he wasn't even perhaps, he said, that's an Andalus, there's a different context there. Right? And I'm not sure what that, what the situation is there. So for us, you know, we, we should be careful about saying, well, you should do it this way or do it that way, or asking an Imam from overseas, this is our situation. Because I've seen in front of me, People describe certain situations. You know, I've seen people from America go to someone, a man overseas, and they say, you know what, I have a gas station, and um, unless I sell pork and alcohol, I go bankrupt. What should I do? And then the, and then the sheikh will ask him, well, does that mean you'll be like in the street and destitute? Yeah, I'll just be completely ruined. What should I do? He says, well, if it's either between you living in the street or selling pork and alcohol at your gas station, then I guess you have to sell it. And then he comes home and he's just smiling, and I have my fatwa. But nus al fatwa al istifda al su'al. You gave him a wrong impression. You will not go bankrupt if you don't sell alcohol and pork in your gas station uh, uh, market, whatever it's called, gas station store. And you could probably do another business anyway. You're not going to be out in the street. If you have enough money to manage a gas station, then you have money to do something else. So there was a wrong scenario that was translated to begin with, and based upon that, the fatwa came back in response to the way the question was asked, not in response to the way the situation actually is. So even when we see some of these spurious fatwa, be careful, because if we're not seeing the first half of it, how was the question asked, how was it posed, then it's very likely, if it sounds funny, that something, you know, something was missed there. And then finally, knowing the difference between immutable and flexible aspects of the Sharia. A thawabit wa mutagayyarat. So thawabit means those things are, are unchangeable, they're immutable, they're consensus issues, they're not going to be subject to, uh, you know, because I, we live in America, this is the way we do it now. Right? We're still going to pray five times a day, we're still going to pray Jumu'ah, those type of things. But, um, you know, I have to wear a thawb and a kufi and um, Islamic dress, would that be better for me here? Not necessarily. That's a, that's a, a question of ishtihad. Right? Am I going to practice a sunnah in that this is what the, what the Prophet Muhammad may have wore something like this? Or is the sunnah to wear the, the custom of the people that you're associated with? Modo ishtihad. That's up to you to figure out, to, figure, you know, to think about that and to arrive at a conclusion, but it's certainly not from the thawabit. It's not from uh, the things that are immutable. What's immutable is that you are modest in your dress, that your aura is covered, your nakedness is covered as stipulated by the sharia, that Allah yasif wa Allah yashif, right, that it, it doesn't accentuate the body parts underneath, that it's form-fitting, and also that it's not transparent, both males and females. If you've done that, unless you want to wear purple and blue and whatever colors and so forth, one is free to do so. Um, as long as they're following the thabit part, am al mutadayir, right, then that's up to people. Um, but understanding which aspects are like that and which aspects are like this is also part of the boundaries of, uh, of the sharia. And we'll stop here for now. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.